And the time now is approximately 9.49 a.m. on the 23rd of September 2015. And I'm going to uh, retrieve Basil from the cell area and move him into the uh, interview room. In today's video, we are going to see a man who kills three women, yet somehow still believes himself to be the victim. In one day, three people lose their lives, all because of one man's paranoid narcissism. On September 22, 2015, Basil Barutsky went on a murderous spree, killing three women from past relationships. He killed his first victim, Carol Culloden, by choking her at home with the television cable. He then stole her car and drove to the home of his second victim, Anastasia Kuzik, and shot her with a sawed-off shotgun. Afterwards, he drove another 30 minutes to the home of his final victim, Natalie Warmerdam, who he also shot. Can you make it in, Buzz? Do they fit all right? Good enough. I guess they're more comfortable than uh, this, this uh, white suit for sure. Anyway, your, your food's arrived next door, so uh, if you want to come along, do you want to grab a sweater in case you get uh, cold? Okay. We're just going a bit of a green mix. Uh, your food and coffee on the left there. <laughs> you know what? I didn't. Uh, I didn't get to pick it. Actually, what happened is the officer that went out to uh, pick up your food, uh, he neglected or forgot to get me a copy as well. So I just kind of basically commandeered his, and that's how I got stuck with the uh, the big one. Barutsky is brought into the interrogation room and given a meal. The detective is warm and friendly, exhibiting a remarkable level of professionalism in light of the crimes that Barutsky has committed. Now, Basil, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Is it Borutsky? Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks very much for taking a few minutes to come in and talk with me. You just go ahead and eat. Have your coffee, take your time, that's not a problem at all. I'm going to do the same. Um, basically, as I said earlier, my name is Kaylee O'Neill, and uh, I'm a detective sergeant with the, with the Ontario Provincial Police. Um, I'm in the science section. And um, just so you know, Basil, um, this room right now is being audio and video recorded. That's what these black balls up in the corners are. And there's also an audio recording here as well, just to back up in case there's some kind of technical malfunction. And just so you know, because we're in a police station, you're actually probably being recorded everywhere you go as we're walking around here, um, just so you're aware of that. Um, basically, um, I've been asked to come and uh, speak with you here today, Basil, um, and I have a number of functions that I perform. And the most important function that I do perform is that um, I'm responsible for making sure you understand exactly what's going on here today and, what, and what's going to be happening. Now, I know you've had dealings with other officers, um, not only from the OPP, but also from the Ottawa Police Service. And what I want to make sure is that there's no misunderstanding about what we're here talking about today. And really all I want to know is what's your understanding of why, why we're here right now, Basil? Is it okay to call you Basil? Is that what you normally go by? No, Basil. Basil? You're here trying to get me to say something to incriminate me in any way you possibly can. An astute observation by Barutsky, who remains calm as he eats his meal. His tone of voice is level and he gives short, concise answers. 
he has a tight rein on his emotions, which means he is the type of suspect that can be difficult or even impossible to crack. Well, that's not entirely true. Um, I certainly am interested in what the truth is here today, but my primary purpose is to make sure that your, your rights as a Canadian citizen are being met, okay? That's, that is the number one function of my job, first and foremost. Um, my understanding of the reason that you're here today is that uh, yesterday you were arrested um, for murder times three. Okay, and my understanding is that the three individuals that uh, were murdered are Carol Culleton, uh, Anastasia Kuziak, and Natalie Warmerbay. And those are the three, indi three individuals that were murdered and those are the three individuals that you've been arrested for. Okay, so that's why you're here today. Um, that's why you were arrested and uh, that is some of what I'm going to be talking with you about here today. Okay, um, you are going to be going to a bail hearing this afternoon. And if you have any questions at all as we're speaking here, Basil, Basil, you just go ahead and, uh, and fire away, okay? Well, listen. Sorry, I, I think I missed that. I still have a list. Okay. Um, so do you understand? That those are the charges that are that are uh, being brought against you right now. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions about that? No. I didn't murder anybody. Okay. Um, do you know what your rights are, Basil? I mean, to remain silent. That thing. Yep. Yep. And that's it. absolutely, that's part of it. The reason why I'm asking is, you know, I know a little bit about uh, your background. I know obviously you're, uh, you know, a bright individual, so I'm not trying to snow you on other, say other officers have gone over this with, with you already. But what I find, it's been my experience that um, even though people are provided their rights to counsel, um, they don't necessarily understand them to their fullest because of uh, the circumstances that they're in at the time. So basically all of our rights, Basil, are guaranteed. Okay, and they're guaranteed under what's called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the Charter of Rights states that when someone's been arrested or detained, they must be advised of their right to counsel or, or basically their right to a lawyer. Now, obviously as of right now, you have been arrested for murder, okay? So if you'd like to phone a lawyer. For killing, not murder. For killing, not murder, okay. Um, if you'd like to speak to a lawyer or to duty counsel, I can make a phone available to you to do that. Okay, so if you'd like to phone a lawyer to seek legal advice, I have a phone list that's available to you for free legal aid lawyers. First of all, do you understand that, right? I don't understand that the system is so corrupt that... Well, it's difficult for sure. I don't know if it's, I wouldn't say it's necessarily corrupt, it's but it's, corrupt. it's definitely got some... Uh, it's corrupt some things that we need to spend some time working through. And the first thing all I want to do right now, Basil, is make sure you understand your right, okay? I understand you talked to a lawyer earlier, a duty counsel lawyer. I know. Last name? I'm so tired, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Well, and, and you know what? Basil, again, that's why, uh, that's why I'm here going over these things again with you now, because I know you were, you know, in, in a very uh, unique, situation yesterday and I know you were no doubt tired and uh, I want to make sure that's why I'm going over these rights of you because I want to make sure you know that we have these opportunities afforded to you. All right. Detective Sergeant O'Neill goes into detail about the rights available to Barutsky. Barutsky remains unimpressed, expressing his opinion that the law enforcement system is corrupt. While he isn't necessarily wrong so far, O'Neill has done his job correctly. So it is your right to talk to a lawyer. And if you'd like to talk to a lawyer, I can get a, a lawyer on the phone for you. You can talk to your own lawyer if you have a lawyer. You can talk to a duty counsel lawyer or a legal aid lawyer who are available to give you free advice. Do you understand that right, Basil? 
supposed to find in matter? Well, it, it, it does matter. It matters to me that, that you understand. Does that make sense to you? No. What, what part does it make sense? The corrupt part. You had a corrupt liar on the phone and talk to them. Right. Well, and you know what? I'm absolutely willing to talk to you about uh, your feelings about the, the corrupt system that uh, we're, work, we're working in right now. That's the way you want to perceive it. Um, but you're right to talk to a lawyer. It's, it's relatively simple. And I just want to make sure that that's clear to you. So do you want to talk to a lawyer right now? I don't want to talk to any crooks. Well, I don't necessarily think all lawyers are crooks and certainly not duty counsel lawyers or legal aid lawyers or several other lawyers of choice that are available. So if you'd like to speak with a lawyer at any time today, Basil, you can just let me know when I can make that happen for you. Okay? So would you like to would you like to talk to one right now? No point, I just there's no point right now. If you change your mind and you decide you'd like to talk to one later, will you let me know? Does that seem fair? I'll let somebody know. Sorry, I couldn't hear you, Basil. I'll let somebody know. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm here, right? I'm, I'm the one that can make that happen for you. So if you let me know, if you change your mind, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to get a lawyer on the phone for you. Is that fair? No. Okay. Well, in my opinion, Basil, we live in a very good country. And yeah. I'm, I'm sure you know that we all have the same rights and freedoms. You, me, everybody. But there's some things that we're required to do by law, Basil. For example, for me, uh, I drove a car here today. So the law requires me to have a driver's license. But there's also things that we don't have to do. And one thing you don't have to do is, is sit here and talk to me. Basically, Basil, the law considers me to be what's called a person in authority, and this is a criminal matter that you're here for today. So basically, I can be subpoenaed to any court in the country to account for what takes place here between you and me. Any, any conversation you and I have, Basil, uh, may be admissible in court. Do you understand that? It doesn't matter. Well, again, it, it does matter because it's your, it's your right. And, if it's something that you want to exercise, then you certainly can. You understand that, though? Every dealing I've ever had is malicious prosecution on the part of the OPP, so it doesn't matter. Well, first of all, I'm not here to prosecute you of anything. That's not my job, Basil. I'm not a prosecutor. You're certainly not a positive person on my side. Well, I mean, I think I... Make sure you had some clothing instead of that jumpsuit, right? After they started me all the yes, they never fed me nothing, wouldn't give me nothing, not even water. Yeah, that was really nice. But again, that wasn't me, right? I just got here this morning at about Ooh, so eight yeah. So-called brothers, great bunch of human beings. Well, there's difficult people to deal with in all walks of life, isn't there? Mm. But I think we could, it's fair of me to say that I showed up here and the first thing I did was make sure you got food and clothing. Right? That's supposed to make you feel special. The first officer that arrested me should have had some decency. Now that I've done that, the next thing I want to do is make sure that uh, your rights are, are available to you and understood by you. So I know that you talked to a lawyer yesterday, but yesterday was yesterday. Today's a new day and things may have changed for you in your mind. And I want to make sure that I'm still giving you that opportunity if you want to exercise it. Now you said you don't want to right now. If you change your mind down the road, you let me know and I'll make that call happen for you. Barutsky complains about his treatment, but O'Neill refuses to rise to the bait. He reiterates that he has treated Barutsky correctly and once again emphasizes Barutsky's right to a lawyer. 
Whatever else comes from this interrogation, it can never be said that Barutsky lacked the opportunity to receive counsel or that his rights weren't explained clearly. Is that fair enough, sir? You said before. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch you there. That's what you said before. Okay. Now, Major, there's one last thing I want to make you aware of here. Um, you know, I want you to clearly understand that anything that may have said been said to you previously, I don't want that to influence you or make you feel compelled to say anything at this time. So anything you felt influenced or, or compelled to say earlier, uh, you're not now obliged to repeat, nor are you obliged to say anything further. But whatever you do say may once again be given as evidence. All right, Basil? Basically, I, I know that you've spoken with other police officers before you spoke with me. And if anyone told you that you have to talk to me, that is incorrect. Does that make sense, sir? Okay. Is there anything about what I told you that uh, you don't understand or you have any questions about? I mean, I realize that maybe you don't, you don't care about it and that's fine, but it's important to me that you at least acknowledge that you understand what I'm saying. And I'm at least speaking clearly and... Do you know what malicious prosecution is? I think I've heard the term before. For all I know is you're a... Uh... A what? Right up that alley. So there's no reason for me to talk to you. Well, you don't, uh, you don't have to talk to me, right? And like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a prosecutor. Like I said, I am uh, interested in making sure that your, your, your rights are fulfilled and that your needs are met, that you're, that you're being treated fairly and, and humanely. And, uh, I hope I've done a good job of that so far here today. Would you say so? Or is there something I, I haven't done that I could have done? Is there anything else I could have done, Basil? Or am I doing all right so far? You're wasting your time. Well, I'm not. I'm not wasting my time at all. I'm wasting my time. Well, you may feel that way, but like I said, I mean, I realize you're in this situation. I'm sure you don't want to be here. I don't necessarily want to be here at this moment in time right now either. But basically, I was in Sudbury and I came here at one o'clock in the morning to come and talk to you because I was asked to come and speak to you and I wanted to come and talk to you. And the first thing I have to do when I do uh, arrive in situations like this is make sure that the individual I'm speaking with is, is properly taken care of. What is it about this malicious prosecution? Why, why did he bring that up? Or what does it, what does it have to do with me? You're a police officer. Mm-hmm. That's true. We are part of the big brother. One does something dirty, the rest of us all follow suit and hide and keep the guy safe. Well, I can appreciate that that perspective is out there. No, it's there. No. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not denying that people uh, believe that's what happens. Um, Basil, because you are here at uh, the police station, we are to some degree responsible for, for your health and safety. Um, so I have some questions I'd like to go over with you just about uh, any, any concerns that uh, we may need to address. 
with you in terms of your health. Is that fair? Can I go over those with you? Right, that I'd like to see a doctor as soon as possible. And I'm on the pain medication. And I'm just going to call my doctor, Bruce Harris, and find out. And, uh, yeah, those are, those are exactly I things I take it every about. four hours, and he said I wouldn't give me any, and he wouldn't give me water all day yesterday. Is there any other concerns? Like, oh, God. O'Neill is doing his best to make sure that Barutsky gets proper representation and medical care. But Barutsky isn't making it easy. Instead of accepting O'Neill's offers, he seems to prefer to complain about his previous treatment. While this seems petty and tedious, this desire to portray himself as a victim, with everyone out to get him, may provide a solid method of questioning later on. I've got a lot of those are exactly the issues I want to address. You come along and ask them. I believe you're Mr. Nice Guy. Every officer here should be taking care of people like a human being. I agree with you. I think you're absolutely right there. And that's what I'm trying to do for you right now. Don't try to make yourself a nice guy. All the officers should be treat people like people. I, I don't have to try to make myself a nice guy. I just am a nice guy. I know that we've never met before and you haven't ever dealt with anybody that I've had to deal with in the past, so you don't know that and I can appreciate that, but believe me, it doesn't take any effort on my part. Now, at this point, all I'm trying to do is find out about your medical concerns, which you seem to have some of, and I would like to know about them so we can properly care for you. And I'm sitting here willing to find that information out. All I'm asking you to do is be courteous and answer those very simple questions about your health so we can make sure you're being well taken care of. I've asked every officer in the ER and you've got no response. Well, here's your, your here's your opportunity. Here's your opportunity. question and I'll answer it. Okay, thank you, sir. Do you have any issues with diabetes? No. Uh, do you have any issues with your hearing, Basil? No. Do you have any issues with your back? Yes. Okay, what's going on with your back? I have four ruptured discs. I'd prefer if you contact my doctor and find out all the information so you don't torture me here. I need four, pain medication. Four ruptured discs? I prefer if you contact the doctor and get it exactly right because maybe I'm not saying the words properly. Okay. And absolutely, I can uh, I can do that. One, what I'd like to do, if it's all right with you, is go through this form so I have all the issues, and then what I'll do is I'll have one of the other officers follow up with your doctor. Does that seem fair? I don't care. Okay. If I have a hernia, it's not a needs operation. I was already put in jail twice. I tried to have it done both times, and they wouldn't do it. And it's still not done because I haven't gotten the chance. I okay. need attention. I need pain medication. How long has this injury been going on for, Basil? I apparently had a B12 uh, deficiency or something. I talked to my doctor. I don't know. I had dizzy spells. Um, I had three concussions in my life. Okay. Um, sir, you said you have some medication for your, your back. Yes. Um, do, you, do you know what that medication is? Oxycodone. Okay. One every four hours. When would the last time have been you would have taken one, Basil? Yes, you morning. Do you recall what the dosage is? No. Okay. Um, Sorry, your doctor's name, what was his name? Bruce Harris. Bruce Harris. Where, uh, where would you practice out of? Paris Bay. Paris Bay, okay. Paris Bay. St. Francis Hospital. St. Francis Hospital, okay. Are there any other medications that uh, you require other than the oxycodone? Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch that. Basically. I'm trying to think. He has me on uh, 
and some kind of a, the best is just call him. Some kind of a antidepressant, I don't know what it's called. Okay. And it's uh, quinine for um, leg cramps. Charlie Horse takes in head. And uh, I'm supposed to be taking vitamin B12 because I have a deficiency, and I just send blood tests to find out if it's Barutsky is taking several different medications, which he hasn't had access to since the previous morning. Barutsky is taking several different medications, which he hasn't had access to since the previous morning. Lack of antidepressants and pain pills, to which he may or may not have formed a dependency, may be playing a part in the brusque manner he is using with O'Neill. Any issues with uh, ulcers, Basil? No, Basil? I also have uh, something on my foot that I uh, never got to the doctor about. It's either planter's wart or athlete's foot or the whole side of my one foot is... Okay. The doctor's on the way, it's sort of 28, I think. I don't know what the date is. Uh, any issues with epilepsy? No, the rest of it you can get from the doctor. They told you all the problems there. What, um, are you in discomfort right now? Yes. Okay, what, what, uh, where, where are you hurting at the moment? I suffer from chronic pain. Talk to the doctor. Okay, well, the doctor is, as you just said, he's away on vacation and we're going to have to have an officer call the hospital to find out what your medical records are. So it's actually more convenient in the meantime if I get the answers read from you so I can address anything that's going on with you right now. But we'll certainly follow up with the doctor so we can find out what you need and get you the, the care that you need. But I want to make sure you're okay right now. That's why I'm going over this stuff. I'm not trying to be tedious or a jerk or anything. You are. Don't worry about it. Forget it. Call the doctor. You'll get proper information from him. I may not even see it right. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm not going to be asking about the types of drugs or anything like that. Just very broad, general questions like what kind of pain are you in right now? Ask the doctor. You'll get proper answers. He's the professional. Okay. Have you ever had any kind of head injury? I already told you I had three concussions in my life. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you say that. Three concussions. How did you do those? I had a car accident and uh, I broke all of this or whatever in my back and I got a concussion and I busted up my hand. I can't even remember what all. And the guy that hit me was telling the police officer, take this guy to the hospital, he's hurt bad. And uh, he told the cop that about 10 times. He was sitting in the back seat of the cruiser, I was sitting in the front seat of the cruiser. When the guy got out of the cruiser, the cop looked at me and he said, you can fucking drive yourself to the hospital. And he turned and showed me a fucking criminal record that wasn't even supposed to exist. It was supposed to be wiped clean because I was found not guilty. So he fucking left me there on the side of the fucking road. And how I got to the hospital is beyond me. And I got no treatment because I went to a little hospital. I didn't know what else to do. Okay. So now I'm... How many years back are we talking to Basil? I don't know. It happened when I was going to work. Atomic energy, pedal all off glass. That cop should be shot and pissed on for what he'd done to me. So is this, I'm we talking a long time ago, like over 10 years ago or five years ago? Or? Over 10 years ago. Okay. And you were working at Atomic Energy? Okay. That's right. What were you, what were you doing out there? What was your title? Millerite. 
flow rate, okay? Are you retired? I'm disabled now from the accident. From the accident. Okay. And if you look that up on the record, it will say there that it was non-life threatening. It's amazing that I'm alive. Why know all about you good cops, so user? Mm -hmm. If that's not malicious, I don't know what is. So are you able to do anything else for work now? No. It's clear that Barutsky has a pretty extensive history of injuries and health issues and must be in a great deal of pain. While the treatment of the police officer during his car accident is horrible, it may not necessarily be accurate. Barutsky not only had a concussion, but he was also in a tremendous amount of pain and probably panic. That interaction may never have happened at all or may have been very different from the way that Barutsky recalls it. Either way, it shows once again that Barutsky believes himself to be the victim, and everyone is out to get him. Have you had any alcohol or non-prescription drugs in the last two days? No. I am not an addict of any sort. Never was. Ask my doctor. Okay. Were you able to get any sleep last night? I have no idea if I slept on some steel bench. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine with my back what that feels like? No humanity whatsoever. Did you did you mention anything to the guard about? The answer when I mention is that they're not supposed to be comfortable. When I asked them to loosen the handcuff because I had my hand cut off. Who cares? Is it when you were coming over from Ottawa the cuffs were too tight? Is that what you're saying? And they left me sitting outside here in the car. I kept telling them I could hardly feel my fingers anymore. My whole hand swollen. No, oh, it's not blue. I don't care. I had my hands cut off. I feel things a little different than what you do. I was only asking for common sense. Is it fair to say that you're you're getting that from me now? Getting what? Common sense, some courtesy. No. And so what? Have, what have I not done here to? You're a police desperate? officer. I have lots of experience with police officers. I just told you about a car accident and how they treat me. So I don't trust you one little bit. Okay. I know all about your brotherhood. One of you fucks up or lies, the rest of you is all hiding. Doesn't sound like you've had very many positive experiences with policemen. I've never before. had a positive experience with a policeman. Mm -hmm. If there would have been a positive policeman, my whole life would be different. Well. What about the experience we're having right now? Is that positive? I just told you you're a police officer and you're going by that stupid record that you guys made. What, what, what is this record you're talking about anyway? Do you, you have a criminal record? Oh, give me a break. Well, what's it, what's it for? I am not stupid. Why would you even ask me something like that? You think I don't know you read every word of whatever's there? Hey, don't run me for an idiot. Basil, I'm just telling the telling you like it is, man. Uh, about six hours ago, I was in Sudbury on another investigation. Yeah, and you came in here and sat down without knowing nothing about Basil. Well, I'm hoping that he's going to tell me about it himself. Answer the question. You're telling me that you didn't read nothing about Basil. Oh, absolutely not. Let's not okay. kid ourselves. Of course, I've read. I've talked to so the why investigators. Are you I've talked to the investigators about this uh, 
investigation that's going on right now. I've talked to an officer from this detachment who's dealt with you in the past. But I have not sat down and read any reports on you. I have not read your criminal record. I'm aware that you have one. I don't know what it's Which for. Which officer did you talk to that I've dealt with in the past? It was a young lady. I can't remember her name. Kathy Sinoski. No, that, that doesn't sound right. Kathy. Definitely wasn't, definitely wasn't Kathy. Caramel. It was someone named Nicole. And I don't know any officers from this detachment. Kathy Sinoski, other cop, got herself involved. She's my wife's niece. My wife was having an affair with her first cousin. She called Kathy. Kathy called another cop named Ian Anderson, who was her boyfriend. He got involved and said that he had knowledge of me assaulting my wife, and he caused the police officer investigating to charge me for nothing. The officer never even met me, and he said he had knowledge. He's a liar. And again, I, I've just met you, and I told you if I have very limited that knowledge is. of you. And I'm trying to learn a little bit about it. What's the point? Well, the point is that you're here, and I'm here. And Malicious prosecution, that's the point. O'Neill doesn't even pretend that he isn't aware of Barutsky's past history and hasn't specifically read any type of file or Barutsky's criminal record, but he has talked to several officers who have dealt with Barutsky. And once again, Barutsky has an incident with a cop where he is supposedly completely innocent. Is it possible that his wife and her relative conspired against him? Absolutely. It is even within the realm of possibility that he has been treated poorly by police officers on multiple occasions. But with each story that he is completely innocent, the probability decreases. I think you might have uh, some difficulty identifying any malice between me and you right now. Wouldn't you agree? You already are asking me stupid questions as if pretending that you don't know I have a criminal record. I am not stupid. No, no, I told you I knew you had so a criminal I don't record. Want to talk about it. I told you I knew you had a criminal record. I no, said no, I didn't no. know what it was for. No, 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 no. Don't change it. No. I know what you're doing. It's okay. Basil, do you care what people think about you? No, I don't want people to think about me. I have a few friends that are really friends. The rest of people in this society are all judging me now on what you have done to me. Well, it's good that you have some good friends. I mean, most people can't even say that. Where did you get your education from? School. University? College? You seem very well spoken, that's why I'm asking. I don't always have the opportunity to speak with people that are well spoken. What does that have to do with Christ? Say it's better in trauma. Sorry, what about trauma? Well, one of the reasons I'm also here, Basil, is that I'm sure you're aware of the gravity of the situation and the seriousness of this investigation. I certainly am, given that you've been arrested for these crimes. And there are more, no more serious crimes than murder. I didn't murder anybody. That's right, you killed somebody. Correct? Killed three people, actually. What's the difference between killing and murder? That was show, not murder. Commandments. Mm -hmm.
So it's killing justified. Is that what you're getting at? I'm saying that. And I believe it's actually thou shall not kill. I you're wrong, you better start reading the Bible. Yeah? Yeah. Find an old version before they changed it. Way back to the King James? Anyway, the importance is that you understand that obviously this is a serious situation. Frankly, Basil, that's why I'm here. I've got a lot of experience dealing with these types of investigations. I've been doing it for almost 20 years now. And it's been my experience that the why these things happened carries a lot of weight. And it's quite important to other people. I'm sure you've seen the news over the years in Toronto and they'll have fascinating headlines such as, you know, 60th murder of the year, 61st murder of the year. And it'll be some story about an old man who was shot and killed in one of the projects and, and then left in a stairwell to die. And people will hear these stories and they'll wonder what type of person could do such a thing. That's a natural reaction that we as human beings have, especially when you just see a half or a third of the story that the media portrays. And really, Basil, this is your opportunity here to explain why you've done these things. Because it might be important to you, I don't know, that people don't have the wrong impression about you. I'm just beginning to develop an impression about you from the limited time we've spent here together. It looks like O'Neill is going to use the let's get your side of the story tactic. This tactic generally appeals to narcissists and those with narcissistic tendencies. It gives them a platform to either brag or complain about all the times they've been wronged. Given the way Barutsky has spoken thus far, this tactic looks promising. And I'm sure it's going to be vastly different from what's circulating in the media right now with the community's thinking. So one of the reasons why I'm here is to give you this opportunity to explain why you killed these three girls. I haven't said anything. Just I just asked you a simple question. Why did you kill these girls? That's it. You're putting words in my mouth, but I didn't say that. Which words am I putting in your mouth? Mm, just so. Well, I can't really put a question in your mouth when I'm asking it. It's interesting how you made the distinction between murder and killing. What that would suggest is that you have some kind of justification for what you've done, which it's also been my experience is always the case. In my career, I've not spoken to one killer who woke up that day and decided they were going to go and kill somebody. Virtually every single one of them found themselves in a set of circumstances beyond their control and they reacted typically poorly, and something happened. There's always an excuse, there's always a reason why. And whether you choose to acknowledge it or not, your opportunity to tell the why is important. Because like I said, what that does, it allows the community to get some understanding of why you did these things. Because on the surface, people just wonder and they will naturally gravitate to what they think is the worst in people. But when you explain why you did these things, then people can get an appreciation for how the situation developed. And sometimes they can even see themselves in that situation. Oh yeah. Geez, if that was me, I may have reacted the same way. 
Now that only really matters to somebody who cares what anyone thinks about them, which is why I asked you that question initially. It's also been my experience that people say they don't care what other people think. That's usually not true. Everyone cares. It's human nature to care. You cared enough to do what you did, so you're going to have a hard time convincing me that you don't care what people think about you. I'm sure you were hurt in some way and reacted in this fashion. And you're not the first to do this, and you're not going to be the last. You wait, Basil. Yeah. Do you have any questions for me? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. It don't make any sense at all. Okay. Do you need me to, to explain anything? Am I speaking too fast? Am I speaking clearly? I don't care about hardly this thing. Because like I said, if at any time you understand what I'm saying, please just let me know. Because I don't want there to be any misunderstanding between you and I. Now, three women are dead because of you. And there's reasons for this. Whether you not whether or not you care to acknowledge them or not. You're putting words in my mouth again. Well, it's, it's entirely up to you whether or not you care to acknowledge that. But here's the thing, Basil, and this is something. This is something I want you to really think about for a second. Because it's important to me that, that you hear these words, okay? Because a lot of people, they, they don't listen when I tell them this. And I really want you to understand this perspective. I understand that you have your perspective right now. You're involved in this traumatic situation that is no doubt I can't even imagine how you feel. But I know other people have been in your situation. And what I want you to think about, Basil, is this. At some point in the near future. The phrasing is carefully crafted so that Barutsky can explain his reasoning while maintaining his preferred role as the victim. So far, Barutsky hasn't taken the bait, but when he does speak, he seems more agitated which might indicate that he is coming closer to opening up. All the details of this investigation are going to come forward. Okay? And what I mean by that is... I'm not sure how extensive your involvement is with police investigations. But basically how they work, they're like a big pie, if you can imagine a big pie, okay? And the pie is broken into all kinds of different sections. Some big, some small, but they make up the whole pie. And the whole picture is the totality of the investigation. And really all that is is the truth about what happened to those three women. And of these various pieces of pie, we have things like forensic evidence, okay? We have our, just like you see on CSI, we have all these sophisticated IDEN officers who go around and collect evidence from the scene, DNA, photographs, clothing, burn analysis. And then we have another section of the pie which includes things like, I don't know, phone records, cell phone records, the rate production work to find out, you know, where phones are, what text messages are going back and forth. And then we'll have another section of the pie, which is more forensic evidence through pathologies, 
Okay, the Center of Forensic Sciences that will conduct autopsies on the victims and find out exactly how they were killed and what the exact cause of death was. The pathologist will explain those details in great detail. And then, of course, we'll have witness statements. The police are out right now collecting witness statements from probably hundreds of people canvassing neighborhoods. And then we'll have people like myself from behavioral sciences coming down and offering opinions, conducting certain interviews, because we have lots of experiences with talking to people in these extraordinary circumstances like you're in right now. And then we'll have Crown attorneys that will look at our investigation and they'll make suggestions to the case managers or detective inspectors from CIB who specialize in nothing but homicide investigations for probably the last 90 years of the OPP. And then we'll have another section which is dedicated largely to the victim's families who will provide input into the lives that were lost and how that's affected not only their families but the community at large. And this last little section of the pie here, basil, it's a very small, thin section compared to all the rest of them. And you don't have to open your eyes and look at it, because I'm sure you can imagine what a sliver of pie looks like. And what that is, it's the truth. And that's what you, the person being charged, that's your section. That's your contribution to the pie. And basically what happens is, Basil is, number one, when you don't tell the truth or when you lie. But what we do is we take all these other sections of the pie and we use them to show how you're not truthful or you're lying. And what happens is you lose credibility. Now, sometimes this slice of the pie might be empty altogether because you could do as you're doing right now and choose not to say anything at all, which is completely fine because that's your right and you can do that. But the risk is, again, we go back to all these other sections of the pie and we use them to prove our case. In great detail, O'Neill has outlined the processes that go into an investigation. Doing so hammers home the futility of Barutsky's silence. But at the same time, O'Neill makes sure to stress that Barutsky is well within his rights to choose to say nothing. And there's a chance that you can lose credibility in the end. Now, the third option is that you actually take advantage of this opportunity to tell your side of the story and explain why you took those lives. In which case, the truth stands because it's the truth and that's what happened. And then we don't need all these other pieces of the pie to show what happened because it's your story and you decided to tell it as opposed to everyone else making decisions about you and what kind of guy you are. And this is what I want you to think about, Basil. This is what I want you to do. I want you to look into the uh, past charges against me by those women, and I want you to do that proper investigation mm -hmm. from the point of view of what really happened, and then uh, have a retrial, a fair trial, and uh, then we'll talk about uh, reality. So any information you want from me, you can get by simply doing the proper investigation for the past. I was put in jail twice, wrongfully. Now go out there and find. You're a good cop. You go out and find out why that's wrong. Well, it's not hard. It's what not were hard. they for? What were you in jail you for? You don't have to look very hard to figure out that no, it's right. Basil should not have been in jail. Speaking in the third person can be an indication of several things. The first is dissociative identity disorder. The second, and one that looks like it applies to Barutsky, is narcissism. And the third, which may also apply here as well, is that it is used as a common tactic among gaslighters for dramatic effect. It also serves to distance someone from their actions. They feel more comfortable if it sounds like their acts are being committed by someone else. After you do that... First step of the investigation is tell me what, what I'm investigating. What were you charged with? Don't pay me for stupid. You know exactly. I don't know, Basil. I don't have to play you for stupid. I don't have to pretend when I don't know what you were charged with. I understand you have a criminal I record. I think you're stupid right now to talk to me as if I'm stupid. 
Just go to pay attention to the computer. Don't don't talk, don't act like I'm an idiot. Well, here's the other thing, guys. The reason why I'm asking is whatever common criminal offense you were charged with, I don't investigate. I only do homicides. I guess that's why you're not going to figure it out because you're not smart enough to go back and find out. Maybe you could find out that, geez, Basil was innocent. Maybe you could find out that some of these cops done some pretty bad things and they framed Basil. Maybe you could find out some of the reality and, and all the pieces might fall into place. But what did, what did they frame you about? What did they do? Was it about women? Could it be? Did I already tell you some stuff? Could it be another? Did I tell you about a Kathy Sinoski and an Ian Anderson? Did I tell you? Did you those, write that down? Those are just names. I don't know what. What are constable then? Write that down, constable, and find out. Look into the past. What their big mouths have to say. The lies they told. Try that out for style. That's a really good place to start. Look at Reggie Armonas. Look at her party. Find out that I told the truth through that whole thing and she lied through the whole thing. Well, I can't, I can't say that I'm shocked about women lying about some kind of domestic situation. That doesn't shock me at all. When I was a road constable, I dealt with that lots of times. Women use the system to their advantage financially for of course every they do. reason they can. Of and course they do. Well, that's corrupt. If you know that, you should be doing something about it. Well, what, what what would you like me to do? But that's the way the world works, Pedro. That's the world. That's the world we live in. Well, you are a stupid fucker if you believe that. If you know that, then you're a cop. You should be trying to change it, shouldn't you? You should be making it right. You know the difference between right and wrong? I do. Mm -hmm. So do I. Well, obviously right. not, because you said you just said that's the way the world is. What a stupid thing to say. If it's wrong, you change it. You're a cop. I'm one cop, right? I'm one person. At and that means you can't do nothing about it, eh? No. Yeah, you don't even open your mouth and voice an opinion. Maybe sometimes you got to take the path of least resistance, Basil. Yeah, because then you stand back and let people like me take the fall. Do your job. You're supposed to be a public servant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I am a public servant. That's why I'm here today providing you with options. You know, the very good one if you know that that happens and you don't do anything about it, you don't speak up about it. Mm. The whole judicial system sucks the big one. No, that's, that's not Take true. That the judicial system, system, they're doing the best they can. It has flaws like anything else, but they're trying to do the best they can. The most horrible thing you can do is put an innocent person in jail. An accuser. I would say the most horrible thing you could do is take the life of a woman. Kill a woman. That would be the worst thing you could do. Yeah. I would say. I think there's a lot of people that agree with me. I think you agree with me. You should re-educate yourself. You think killing women is okay? It's good? Don't put words in my mouth. I never said no. I don't need to put words in your mouth. They're coming out just fine. I'm just pointing out some fairly obvious observations. I'm talking about the reality of how things get to where they are. And the reality right. is three women are dead. And you're you killed them and you're talking about how you were wronged years ago in some kind of cheesy, what, domestic yeah. assault charge? That's what you hear? That's what you're telling me. No, Vaguely, right. you're not really telling me. I'm asking you because I want to know and you don't really want to tell me. You're just kind of dancing around the issue. Really? That's the way to see it, eh? Huh? You're talking about malicious prosecution. How about uh, malicious victimization? When, when if you're so such a victim in this, and you don't want to tell me about it, what do you want me to do about it? I mean, I'm not going to go running out and punch up reports and punch up criminal records and, and read about you when I'm not here to do that. When really you don't want me to, because if you did, you would just tell me and save a lot of time. Notice how O'Neill is raising the pressure by slow, steady increments. He never reacts to any personal attacks and he never loses control. But he is not as affable as he was when he first entered the room. And he presses back on whatever Barutsky has to say. This makes Barutsky feel more argumentative, but not completely defensive. He's much quicker to speak, which means that he's more likely to let information slip. You're an educated man, you're a religious man, so you know that sometimes the way the world works doesn't work out always the way it should be. 
You have a clear understanding of the picture I just portrayed to you of an investigation and what the truth, the importance of it could mean for you. the serenity to accept the things I can, the courage to know the different and the wisdom to whatever. Mm-hmm. Read that. Think about it. Mm-hmm. Well, going back to thinking about it, Basil, the reason why I was explaining this investigation is because this is what I want you to think about. And it might be the only thing of value you take from this conversation you and I have here today. Me, I don't really need anything else. I mean, I've kind of done my job in one sense. That I've been here making sure you're fed and trying to look after your medical needs and giving you an opportunity to speak. What I want you to think about is this. In the near future, people are going to be making decisions about you. In the very near future. People like lead investigators on this file. People like crown attorneys. Potentially someday a judge. Potentially someday a jury. Certainly the community and your peers, they are going to be making decisions about you and the way you've conducted yourself. That is going to happen. Now, what I want you to think about is if you were in their position, if you were looking at this investigation, if you were looking at the allegations against you and the evidence and the content of this case, what would you think about what you've done here and how you're portraying yourself? You're a reasonable guy. What would you make of all this if you were looking at it from the outside in? Would you like to sit back and watch this video? of you talking about how, I don't know how many years ago, uh, some investigation went bad for you, some assault investigation, when you're here under arrest for killing three women? Is that what you'd like to see on video? Would you like to see on video how nonchalant and non-interested you look for these cameras right now, when three women are dead because you killed them? Nonchalant. Well, I mean, that's the adjective that comes to mind right now. You're not happy for me. You're not you don't have to be happy for me because what's going to happen is when I'm done here, Basil, when I'm done talking to you, I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk out of this room and I'm going to go on to the next case. And I won't give this a second thought because there's lots of other cases just like this one. This might be a unique situation for you. It's not unique to me at all. It really isn't. You're not blowing my hair back here, man. This is not my first rodeo, okay? And when I walk out of this room, when we're done here today, your opportunity to fill in that pie and affect the way people think about you and what you've done is gone. This would a liar. Hmm? Would be with somebody that is supposed to be representing me. I didn't catch the first bite of that, Basil. What about a lawyer? Is going to be representing you? That would be when I would be telling my story to a lawyer that is interested in representing me. You are not representing me. You are representing evil. No, I'm representing the truth. I'm representing three dead girls, three dead women. If you were you'd be looking at two ex girlfriends of yours, <coughs> three. three, three. No, I don't think Natalie was. I think okay. she turned you down, right? I lived with her for three years. What are you talking about? Came for half the farm. Work on it. Sorry, Anastasia is the one that turned you down. Turned me down. She's quite a, quite a bit younger than you too. You're not the first guy to be turned down, though. I wasn't turned down by Anastasia. I was dating Carl Culleton, and I was working on Anastasia's house. Okay. She was a friend, like a daughter. She lied in court. Sometimes people are not truthful. A lot. She lied a lot, and the crown attorney said, it's okay to lie. That was her end statement thing. It's okay, some people lie. 
So is that what way was the point of going to court when it's okay to lie? The skillful delivery is enough for Barutsky to start volunteering more details about his relationships with these women. It probably comes as no surprise that once again, he portrays himself as the victim, even going so far as to claim that the judge told one of the women that it was okay to lie. This sounds like something any halfway competent defense team could use to get the case tossed out, or at least demand a retrial with another judge. It's hard to believe that a judge would actually say such a thing, but it's obvious that Barutsky completely believes this is what happened. So is that why you killed these girls, Basil? Because they're, they're not going to get their comeuppance in court? They're going to lie and they're going to escape responsibility? If you're a cop, you should know that people that use the system are guilty. That's true, but it's not our job to go around and it takes it is justice into our own hands. It's not into your own hands. It's reality. I was in jail for nothing. The person that accused me should have been charged. So what did these women do to you that made you have to kill them? That's the burning question so of the day. So I'm in jail for nothing, and that doesn't matter to you? Not right now, no, because uh, well, you going into jail for a little while kind of pales in comparison to being dead, don't you think? I think it's quite important that uh, when innocent people go to jail, the police don't do anything about it, they don't investigate, they don't care. Well, why, you know what, really, why do we have to do anything about it when we have you to take care of these problems? I have no idea what you're talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's very evident what I'm talking about. We're, we're way beyond. Listen, uh, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but the question out of my mouth this whole time we've been here was certainly not, did you kill those three girls? Because you did. That's very clear from this investigation and witnesses and evidence. I don't need, I'm not asking that question. That's not a question I need an answer to. That's not what I care about. It's irrelevant. It's a moot point. My only concern was why you did this to them. What could they possibly have done to make you so angry that you decided in September of 2015 to go and kill these three women? And the only rational explanation I can think of is that they obviously hurt you in some way. Either rejected you or lied to you or somehow disrespected you. That's the rational explanation from the rational person looking in at this. Unless I'm missing something glaringly obvious. Obviously you are. I keep telling you that I was framed, that I'd done time in jail, which ruined my reputation, ruined. Well, you certainly you certainly weren't framed this week. I mean, you may have been, you, maybe something happened to you when you went to jail and maybe something went uh, awry with the investigation. I do not know. If that was the case, that's most unfortunate. But speaking about that investigation right now is not my concern and it should not be your concern. I fail to agree with you. I think it should be your concern. Well, we have to have a hierarchy of concerns, Basil. I'm sure you can understand that. Yeah, well, you have to find there, start at the lower key and work up to the higher key to understand it. Well, that's not the way the world works. Come on, we both know that. That's the way it should work. Well, if there's the way it should work, ideally, then there's the way it does work. Yeah, it doesn't work. Does and I don't work. think that the people in this community would appreciate me ignoring you having taken the lives of those three girls just to go open up a case where you may have been wrongly charged years ago that you don't even just, want to tell me about. Just, these are words so small, just like Basil's life is just a case. Basil's life is a bunch of cases and police officers who maliciously prosecute. Well, Basil's, Basil's life is a big case right now. Yes, it is. It's very big. It's very big in the news all across Ontario. And the police made it that way. 
No one in the media made it that way. Yeah. Actually, you made it that way. <laughs> you are the one that made it that way. You made this situation, not me. I was minding my own business in Sudbury yesterday. No idea who you were. But here I am in a room talking to you, trying to find out who you are, trying to find a reasonable explanation for why this happened. Mm-hmm. Trying to find some shred of hope that the community is going to hear and have an understanding of why things like this happen. What was done to you if the community hurt you so badly know, that you had to If do the these community things? wanted to know, they would start an independent inquiry and look into the past. How did it ever evolve to get to this? Because Basil Berutsky is a kind, caring, God fearing human being. So how you know do what? There? I that's, guess we that is to, a point we agree on. We need to go back to the past and find out how could this have happened. That is a point we agree on. Finally, Barutsky shows signs that he's going to talk. O'Neill has carefully orchestrated this moment by making it appear as if he might actually be bored by Barutsky's story and that his reasons for the murders won't have an effect on the outcome of the case. This sets Barutsky off, just as it would with any narcissist. He has to prove O'Neill wrong and give details about what drove him to do such things. At this point, he's almost eager to talk, even if his tone is still combative. If there's one thing I do know what people have said about you is you're a kind, caring person, which is why I'm having a difficulty with this contrast in behavior. Even these women that are no longer with us have said that about you, stood by you in the past when you were charged. Friends that you have, friends that they have, so that you were a good, caring person. From what I understand, it looks like you're uh, acting as a handyman for, for some of these women, helping them out when they, in, the, in their time of need. So I would agree with you that, yes, that is what people say about Basil, that he's a caring, good person. The religious side wasn't apparent until I sat down and started talking to you, but I can obviously see that as well. Make no mistake, people aren't out there saying that you're some kind of terrible person. Which is one of the reasons why I agreed to come here from Sudbury to talk to you today. It's because that's the kind of thing that people are saying to you. They are saying that you're a good person. You are helping. You are caring. And I don't understand how this happened. Just like everybody else doesn't understand. And that's why I wanted to take the time to come here and talk with you. It would have been easy for me just to go to the investigator and say, oh yeah, look, you got enough here, see you later. I don't need to talk to this guy. You got better things to do. But I wanted to take the time to talk to you. And when I because I don't understand. Talk over me some more. You said anytime you want to, uh, just, yeah. and every time I do, you just keep on talking. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, you're sorry, all right. But what did you want to say? Every time I try to tell you the proper thing to do is to find out that I was innocent of all those charges, all those things dragged to court. Okay. And that there was police officers that constantly didn't do what they were supposed to do, constantly tried to frame Basil. And then you'll see how it evolved little by little by little to the point where Basil has no choice. The system is okay. just screwing him. So which which cases are we talking about here? What do you want me to look into? What are the officers' names? I'm going to write them down. Oh, you didn't write down already? Oh, it wasn't down. even important to you about uh, Kathy Sinoski, Ian Anderson, okay. and the past, and how red you are on us. Basil, I, ju- I, need you, I need you to slow down for me. I can't. That's why I didn't get them the first time around. You blew through them so fast, and you're on to the next thing. I didn't even hear them about Kathy somebody. Kathy, Basil, Cernowski, Cernowski, maiden name, she's married to a cop, I think she's so. your wife's niece, is that correct? Right. Okay. She's married to a cop. I believe her married name is Lemelin or something like that. She, now what? She threatened to shoot me. And she was going to police college. Now she teaches police. 
She Ooh. threatened to shoot you. Right on. So what? But what was the case I'm looking into here? What was what was the allegation that you feel you're wrongly convicted of, or somebody lied in? I believe that time that the wife took off with her first cousin and lived with him for six months. And uh, your wife. That's right. Okay. And then she made a fictitious charge that supposedly happened years before, or whatever you call it, and just so that she could get custody of the children. And she got Kathy and Ian to call the officer investigating Reggie Armonis. And the first thing Reggie done was the raw property. She Hold on a sec. Reggie Armonis? Armonis. Convert police at the time. I don't know where she is now. Armonis. Pembroke, please. Okay. Sorry. So Reggie was investigating. So she said she made up some story you're saying to gain leverage to get Anderson wasn't even a cop here. He was somewhere in Northern Ontario and Kathy was here and uh, I don't know where she went to college. She went up there too after she, and then she broke up with him and she married some other cop here. But she got, um, the ex-wife got Kathy to phone and talk to Ian. Ian phoned Reggie, said that he had knowledge of me assaulting my wife, which is a direct lie because I've never met the man in my life, so knowledge is knowing. And then Reggie came back and turned around. The whole story changed. Reggie told me to take my child home, which I did. Everything was good. When I brought the kid back, all this had gone down, and I ended up getting charged with a historic six-year-old something and then okay and my ex-wife charged me twice so with charges basil what was your way i'm still talking i didn't butt in or, you know please don't butt in if you want to hear it story let me continue barutsky is now enjoying his place in the spotlight and resents any type of interruption now that he has decided to tell his version of the story, it looks like it's going to flow fairly steadily. It's something that he obviously dwelt on for a long time, and this event, in particular, happened years ago. But he still knows the name of each person involved without having to pause to think about it. Barutsky has never moved on and has allowed this to fester, and with each negative interaction with a woman, he has stacked them together. I just need to know, is this a different case so I can box it off? It's the uh, same case. Okay, same case. Why do you think cases are just like a few words and it's over? No. There's a reality to things, you know? Okay. Truth. If you read the Bible, maybe if you had a little that, you, you, you'd understand. Okay. Uh, can I just ask why you No, see? stop. My ex-wife was seeing her first cousin and she thought she was going to lose custody of the girls. So she made up all these stories about me raping her and assaulting her. And I forget how many charges, 12, something. And they were all in the, I was found not guilty of. But I would have run through the ring and my reputation moved, ruined. And all because she couldn't face the truth, thought she, the only way was to keep her, the children or get custody was to say bad things with me. She even went to the, the, the shelter months after she was living with the guy, pretending that she was afraid of me. Why would she go to the shelter? When she went there, I thought it was because the guy she was with was beating on her. The whole system. So. In reality, the wife charged me three times. Twice, I was found not guilty with a jury, well, well, with a judge alone. And then the last time, I forget what they called it, she refused to go through with it because she said it was because she had cancer, whatever. But she, it lasted long enough that she got what she wanted from the family court, made me look like an asshole. And then, Charges were dropped or whatever stayed, that's the word. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want them stayed. I wanted to go to court and be proven not guilty because I wasn't. The system should have seen three times the same charges, found not guilty of 20, and she's doing it again. 
but they didn't. They didn't even try to see the truth. Get Basil. And then there's even with Anastasia Kuzik. She sells my tractor. When the police are called, the police officer says, that's stealing, that's theft. When the police officer is called, he says, I'm, we're not going to do anything about it. It's a such sensitive situation. Sensitive? She stole my tractor and sold it. What does that make her out to be? And the police protected that theft. Corruption and corruption. Another police officer, Miller, are you writing them down? Yep. Do you know his first name? No, I never ran into much of him. Pem Pembroke or OBB? Miller. Okay. I got a beaten with a baseball bat in the field. I didn't know why I was getting it beaten. And it took a year or two later for me to finally find out Natalie Warmerdan was screwing the neighbor while she was married to her husband, before I came along. When I came along, he was pissed off. I often wondered why the man didn't like me. I tried to help him, I helped him fix his pool. He just, and then one day I'm getting be beaten with a baseball bat because I bit my baler caught fire. I'd done nothing wrong, totally innocent. And I find out it's because all those he found out there it was because I took his affair girlfriend next door. With, I had no idea. So I get a beaten with a baseball bat, could have been killed. Miller comes along and the first thing they say is, Basil, you're under arrest. I said, for what? He said, you're drinking beer. So what? I'm on my own property. I'm having a beer after a fire. And it took the Crown Attorney to look that through and see that it was wrong and made Miller go back and charge the guy with assault. The guy hit me three times with a baseball bat and finally I got the hit him and broke his nose. Other than that, I would probably be dead. And I ended up charged. Unbelievable. And I'm a cripple. And here's a young guy with a baseball bat beating on me. And in the end, he gets like six months probation or something. Listening to this story, one has to wonder if Brudzki has been to blame for anything in his life. He certainly doesn't seem to think so. Given his history and general attitude, it's amazing that he keeps trying to have relationships. He says that he only has a few friends, and it's pretty clear why. He beat me with a baseball bat, attempted murder. But he was beating on Basil Brutzi. Makes it okay. I understand. I understand how it works. The police have never treated me fair. The system has not treated me fair. I never lied in court. I never lied with my ex wife. I never lied any of it. But the court system seems to want to believe the lies instead of the truth. It certainly sounds like you've had a rough go with justice. My ex-wife was raped by her brother from the age of 12 years to I don't know how old. I dealt with that. I tried if the police would have simply left him. And the man's still walking around Godfrey. That would be Kathy's uncle, Constable Kathy. And they all hide the big family secret and he didn't just do it to my ex-wife. And everybody thinks I hate my ex-wife for all those charges she made against me. I don't hate her. I understand, I understand she went through hell. I just wish she told the truth, face reality. 
Well, that's what we all want. Okay, so ultimately, we all want people to tell the truth. And I think you're telling me the truth right now with all these things that happened to you. So then what we should do is open an independent investigation and find out the truth, find out why this came to this. And there's a hell of a lot more. Hell of a lot more. Is this, is this the, but Basil, is this the extent we have to go to to draw light on your situation? That's what you're going to do. you got to start from the beginning where the seed was sown and then you'll see how it snowballed and snowballed and snowballed to the point where Natalie took advantage of the system and Anastasia took advantage of the system because the police had built me up into, it was just so easy for them. So well, it's thinking. certainly hard. It's, you know what? I'm going to tell you, Basil, it's definitely hard when you don't know somebody like you. I didn't know you until today. Not that I know you right now, but a little bit. But when you don't know somebody and all you have is police reports or the word of mouth of other people, which may or may not be the truth, you know, it's certainly hard for people to I think ignore that altogether, right or wrong, even if they have the wrong opinion of somebody. You understand what I'm saying? I'm listening, I'm not sure. Like if you could, if you don't, you don't know me at all, if you didn't know me at all, all you had were stories about me that other people told you, you would develop an opinion of me before you even met me. From hearing stories about you? Yeah. Hardly. Yeah. Would Most be, people. It would be against my religion. I would not do that. I do not judge people in that. Unless it's direct contact. And, yeah. and I only believe half of what I see, none of what I hear. Because I know about the system, how people... And that's an exceptional way to live life. But that's the proper way. But it is the proper way, but let's be honest. Most let me, tell you, this. Do let me that. tell you this. I'm telling you what needs to be done here. And one of the big things in my life is that maybe, maybe I have to go through all of this. Because I believe that... Uh, there's a poem called Success, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And part of it is a social change for, I wish I knew the thing off the hair. I do know it, but I'm too stressed. But it's take, about change. Take time. It's about having what success is, having a healthy child, a garden patch, a redeemed social condition. If anything, out of all of this, I'm trying to tell you the social condition of people using the police and the system to their advantage by lying and letting it go as far as innocent people being in jail. Because I've been in jail, I never got time. But just think about all those times I was charged by my wife. I was in jail, out of jail, in jail, out of jail. My reputation even though I was found not guilty, I had a criminal record for 20 years or something that wasn't supposed to be there. Did you try and get it? Is that fair? Did you? I ended up getting it removed after I realized 20 years later. Do you know what it's like to live with a criminal record when you're not a criminal, when you're not supposed to have one? And then you find out, oh, all those years, that's why when the cops stopped me, that's why he was such an asshole to me, because I had a criminal record that I'm not supposed to have. I was found not guilty. Yeah. The details surrounding Barutsky's criminal records are a bit confusing. If he was acquitted, he shouldn't have one. If there was some error, there are steps to get it removed. It's almost as if he left it that way so he could use it to blame for the way people treat him. Don't be at me, because even when I told the judge, he said, so what? He didn't understand. No, all I'm saying is I can see why that would be frustrating and make you angry, especially... Frustrating! When it's so unfair, it's so wrong. It's going against your the belief of the way you should when be. When it's going against who you really are, your good character, and then you're being judged by something that's not true, not right, even though you were found not guilty, you're still seen as because the record was not removed. Should never have been there in the first place. 
That's what I was saying a minute ago, basically, about when you hear stories about somebody and you don't know them. It's the same thing as looking and seeing a criminal record and that's telling the story when you don't know the person. That's why, that's what I was getting at earlier. That's why I say I understand why you would be upset by that. Especially when I see the way you're trying to live your life with your, your beliefs. That's exactly what I was getting at. Whether it's a criminal record that or report you're reading about somebody or you're hearing it from someone's word of mouth that's not true. It's just like you said, if you could go through life only believing what you believe when you when you meet the person, not what you hear, that'd be great. Unfortunately, not many people in the world can live life like you are. They have to experience my experience of state garden that that's the only way to trust nobody. Well, trust is certainly something you earn. Believe nobody. Because I want to ask you a question. And it's something I ask a lot of people that I talk to because I'm interested in, 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 in what they think about it. If I was to ask you how you would describe yourself um, on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of your truthfulness, and let's say we had a scale of 1 to 10, and a 1 is a person who never tells the truth, constant liar, and a 10 is the perfect angel, someone who speaks nothing but the truth all the time. I, Realistically, I, I where would you put yourself? I or a nine because I do tell what I would call white lies uh, if I have to go around something so as not to hurt somebody. Or I may not tell something that I know if I think it's going to hurt my daughter or something or that kind of stuff. So, but as far as telling the truth about what's really going on, then I'd be just a 10. You know, I want to lie about anything. I never did. I never lied. From the very. Well, I think, I think there's a necessity for those little white lies. My, you're talking father, about. my father told me a long time ago, Basil, have you ever heard of anybody getting caught in the truth? And that's what stuck. People get caught in lies. You can't get caught in the truth. That's true. Also, my dad said, it's not worth doing if it's not hard to do. What I'm doing is very hard. Very hard. So it's worth doing. I'm trying to show the world how wrong the system is. It's wrong for the system done to me. It's and the system is being used by people. I'm not saying there's not abused women out there. And the system is doing the right thing for them, but there's also so many that are using more, I believe, are using the system corruptly. And I believe there's an awful lot of corrupt police. I know that the percentage here in Philadelphia is phenomenal. Well, okay, so this is a big burden you've chosen to take on. It's universal knowledge that if a system exists, someone will take advantage of it. Killing three people to draw attention to that fact is usually not regarded as a sane or effective response. It's a tough path you're, you're walking here to make this point. It's the true path. Is your father still with us? No. I held his hands when he died. He lived with me. He chose to live with me out of the whole family. How long ago would you passed away? I met Natalie at the hospice. She was a nurse there approximately five years ago. Mm -hmm. She put the make on me. I didn't even know what was going on. I was trying to take care of my father. She told me later that she was trying to pick me up because she thought my family had the money and she was getting divorced and she got what she wanted and then she ditched me when it was over. She simply moved on to one of my hunting buddies 
and then on to somebody else, and then on to somebody else, and whatever. Did your, did your father know how strongly you felt about the justice system? Yes. Before he passed away? Yes. And he told me, I said, Basil, you're smart. You could fix it. Can't fix it. Can't fix it when somebody listens. Thank you. And I'm not religious. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm not religious. I am spiritual. Spiritual? I, believe, a big difference. I understand what you're saying. And if you did understand, then you'd know a difference between killing and murder. There's an awful big difference. Well, if I'm hearing what you're saying, there's a purpose to this killing in the burden that you're trying to take on to change society. Call justice. I've never had justice in my life. I, from what you've told me, I understand how Natalie and Anastasia fit into this, but I don't understand Carol. The very same thing. In what sense, what did she do to you? Did she make some allegation against you that was untrue? Lie for money. Lie for work. And it's, uh, Natalie. I spent $200,000 there minimum. She wouldn't even work. She lived off of me. I worked my farm three years and brought it back. I turned it into a farm. She told me everything I was doing was what she wanted. And then when the court system told her, she fought because she thought she was, we were going to get all the money. She was actually practically my lawyer. When she found out that I was going to get nothing, because as the judge said, he didn't believe a word I was saying. And I was, every word I was saying was gospel truth. He chose to not believe it, not see it, not want to know the truth. And he told, I didn't even know it was possible. He gave everything to my wife and he made me buy my own hunt camp back. So I got nothing. That was the turning point. That is, was exactly when Natalie, no longer, she no more money coming in. She started hunting for somebody else. And that's when the false accusations came. She knew it was so easy because she had just gone through the system. She simply said I was gonna hang her son, threatened. I did no such thing. I said, he walked across the kitchen floor that I was washing. He walked into an office, looked back, went like that, walked back across the floor. I mopped up, he turns around, back, he got it over five or six times. I wanted to hit him with the wet mop right in his face. And I told Natalie when she got home, what are you doing? She would come back and says, yeah, he admits it. So, sorry, he what? Yeah, he admits it. That was it. No reprimand, nothing. They didn't make him come and apologize. They didn't make him. I actually, after, but started believing that she put him up to doing that because it wasn't much longer after. Then when I told her I wanted my money back, that was it. She went off the handle flew. The distinction made by Barutsky about being spiritual rather than religious is interesting. It means that he has no real system of belief. He basically makes up the rules as he goes along, always in a manner where he can justify his every action. This way he can absolve himself of any guilt and anyone that believes otherwise is unjustly persecuting him. To went up to her dad's and next thing you know the police are there and I'm charged with threatening to hang him when all I said is, ah, if you don't smarten up, I'll string you up. Meaning, listen kid, 
Do I deserve to go to jail for that? No. 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 So she used the system. She just stuck with it, right? I think there was another charge. I don't even remember what it was. It was so stupid. Oh, I think it's so stupid. And Anastasia, I was dating Carl Culleton. Anastasia came along. Well, I knew Anastasia way longer than Carl, but. I treated Anastasia like a daughter. She was a friend. She lived in my house with her boyfriend. She tried to sell my land for me as a real estate. All friends, she used to come to the farm, Natalie's farm, my farm. And Using a hot tub with us, her and Eric. They were like friends. So I went to help her because her and Eric were splitting up. She said she needed help to fix the house up. I agreed to help her as much as I could. I ended up kind of half moving in. I still maintained my place. But in the winter, when it got cold, I ended up staying more and more at her place than at my place. People may have assumed that there was a relationship going on, but they would have to be cuckoo, because there was a 20-some year age difference. And if you don't believe me, simply go and talk to my doctor, because I told my doctor she wanted to have something. She walked around, she'd get in the hot tub naked, you asked my doctor, I went there and I said, what is wrong with me? I cannot get an erection. She does all this to me. She even sit on my lap. He said, Basil, it's psychological. She's more like your daughter. It's more like your daughter's age. You see her as your daughter. It was actually a turnoff. But in court, when they asked her if we had a relationship, she said, yes. And the reason was, or if they said, were you in a relationship? She said, yes. That was a lie. She may have wanted it to be more when she tried to part Carl and I, and eventually she did. Mm -hmm. And Carl knew all of this, and I wanted Carl to go to court and testify that she knew all about Anastasia and me treating her like her, calling her like a daughter. Or, and instead, uh, Carl took off with another guy. Then when I got out of jail, Carl's back. She dumps the other guy. So all I fixed her cottage all up. I was probably two and a half, three months of there. Every chance I got, cleaning it up, wiring, plumbing, gave her money. Mm -hmm. She lied to me. She told me she was so broke. I gave her, I even pulled my own RSPs out and gave her my last peanuts. O'Neill is choosing to remain mostly silent. Although Barutsky leaps from subject to subject, it can be pieced together later from the video. Right now, it's best to let him tell his story before he decides to close himself off again. Landscaping. All for nothing, it was all for money. She didn't get much. Natalie got the most. Anastasia got about Natalie got about two hundred thousand, hundred and eighty or something plus. 
Well, pretty well all my equipment, man. And then her son burnt the garage down. Oh, my tools were in there. I got nothing. And then Anastasia would have got me for about 20,000. And Carl would have got me for about I'm not sure. 13 maybe or something like that. I don't know. And then she went back with her boyfriend and she's laughing. Him and her are laughing, calling me the BF. Best friend that'll do anything that she wants. So, all these women used to have put you through the ringer over the years and used you. And they're all connected, they all know each other. They've given you such a hard time. Why do you feel you needed to take on this burden yourself? to prove this point after all this suffering you've already gone through, Basil. Like I said, like this is a difficult road you've chosen here. Why are you doing this just to prove a point? I is there not some other way? I have no idea what you're talking about. What are you talking about other way? Uh, I don't know. I'll explain. Well, all these women here, that have slighted you or, or lied to you in some way, cheated on you. And you've killed them all to make this point that the justice system doesn't work. And that road you've chosen is going to have consequences. So what I'm saying is with all the suffering that you've already done to this point dealing with these three women, You know, why, why are you taking on this, this, this burden to draw society's attention to it by yourself? I'm not quite sure what you're saying, but I think that you not know, think society should open their eyes and change the way they I, look. I do. Certainly. And earlier, you told me yourself that you know that women are abusing the system, use, using the system. So if you know that, common sense would be, obviously there's lots of officers that know that. Why isn't anything done? Why isn't changing? Why isn't, why do you allow people like me to be in jail, rot in jail with a physical disability and suffer with no medication? And then you get out and you're stigmatized and you live your life. You have no idea what it's like when to know that you've done nothing wrong and you... All I guess I'm saying is... I'm sitting here and I'm telling you how you could quite easily see this by going back and tracking what happened, how the police reacted, the non... Uh, the, the things where uh, there was also a bipolar girl in there, Laura Kelly. She was dating a police officer. It just always goes back to the police. I drove her, I was a designated driver. I drove her home, two cops pulled me over, asked me if I drank. And I said, no, not tonight. I'm the designated driver. Carry on. They run my plates. See all those stupid lie criminal record that I was not supposed to have the game chase me down because they thought I was a bad guy because I had a criminal record that was not supposed to be there. It's true that people can be wrongly accused, and it's also true that there is an unfair stigma for people who have been unfairly charged but are not convicted of a crime. But all Barutsky has accomplished with these murders is to strengthen the credibility of these women's accusations. 
And I ended up being charged. They did not let me blow on the breath loads or on her own side. They said I was over. I never even got to put my lips on it. They were listening to music in the car so loud. They were partying. They were half bombed New Year's Eve. And then they took me to the station and they left me in a cell for like two and a half hours before they even asked me to blow. And then they thought I was going to blow in the tube for them. And when I finally did go out and to look at the machine, I could see droplets in the tube. I thought, oh God, they're just setting me up. They just put some alcohol right in the tube and they think I'm going to blow it in there. So no, I'm not going to blow. I'll use a crank. And then the, after the even, uh, Laura, the girl with me, assaulted the, the sergeant, Sergeant uh, Maxsack. So they throw her in the cell beside me. Later, I'm trying to find out there's no record of her ever even being there. She was in the cell beside me. No record. But Basil, what I see is that you're this gentleman who's a spiritual guy who seems to live his life by being truthful to people. Who clearly has respect for his father and, and obviously learned this way to go about living. And here you are being dealt this situation with these women where things are not going your way and you're ending up in going to jail and getting your reputation tarnished on things that are not as they seem. But then we have this drastic departure from the guy that you seem to me to be with your actions here this week. I mean, we can talk about the difference between killing and murder, but this is a pretty I distinct tangent away from the guy Basil is supposed I to be. I don't know what happened. I was reading the Bible the night before, if you go to my house, there's three Bibles right on the coffee table. I was reading the Bible. There was a lady from next door came over. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Swerkowski, Elizabeth. I'm sure you were reading the Bible. Then. And she, after that, Basil. And she talked. Can I keep talking? Why do you keep? Why do you keep butting in? I think I'm doing a good job. No, you're not. Me. But you're butting in when I'm trying to tell you something. Her and I were talking about the Bible. She's religious. I am not. I tried to explain to her that I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. And I, I read the Bible and I understand it more than most priests. And I will debate the Bible with any pastor or whoever wants to talk. Because if they're wrong, I'll show them the Bible where they're wrong. And I've done it many times. And, Basically, well, I think one thing about the Bible, right, if you yeah, know, yeah, if you know, well, hold on there I'm because you know what, you, you bring up some good points that you I think you need to Then you ask me to, well, you have a lot of important things to say, and I can't keep up with a lot of them. I guess that's my fault. But what I'm saying is the one thing about the Bible and spirituality that I think we could probably agree on, and that the majority of people would, is really it's about balance. And in an ideal world, which you may or may not be experiencing, justice is about balance. Far from it. Well, that's ideally what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. And I'm failing to see the connection between these women treating you this way and seeing the balance between that and maybe you, you know, having your name tarnished or doing some time in jail or being emotionally hurt and you having to kill them to prove a point. That balance seems to me to be out of whack for such a spiritual person. I'm trying to tell you some things I told you. If you go back to the beginning. If I went back to the beginning, I I'm would be bad. mad. I'm not allowed to talk. To you. If I went back to the beginning, do you want to know I would be not? mad. Do you want to know or do you not? I do. Well, if you took the time if the system took the time to look at one case and see how this happened, maybe when there are killings in the world, in the country, in the whatever, 
maybe they can understand and change things, change the way they do things. Maybe, maybe something could change. That is exactly what I've been saying so to you all if, along. So if the seed, if an intelligent police officer, like you think you are, would see that if you go back far enough and you find the seed that was sown, and then you see how the 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 corrupt, the the bad started where the police don't care and they only want to investigate and make Basil look bad, when in reality they should have been seeing that Basil is the good. And all of that could have changed by simply the police doing the right instead of the wrong, doing the hard instead of the easy. Just like my dad said, if it's not hard to do, it's not worth doing. And I'm telling you, and every police officer out there, you've already told me that you know that there's corruption, but so what? That's your attitude. Brutsky sees himself as a noble martyr on a quest for justice and doesn't seem to realize that he only comes across as petty, vindictive, and unstable. He is so entrenched in this viewpoint that it is unlikely that he will ever experience true remorse. Because that's the easy way out. The police, the uh, judicial system, use are at fault for half of what goes on out there. I've been in jail before, I've heard so many horror stories. I'll tell you one thing, when you're in jail with a bunch of people, it's really easy to tell who is telling the truth and who is lying. Because in jail, 90% of the people don't care. They'll tell you exactly what they've done because they're in jail with... You don't strike me as a person who doesn't tell the truth. Tell that to the judge. You know, I certainly had a preconceived opinion about you before I had a chance to come and speak to you, which has obviously changed now now that I have a better understanding of why you've done these things and the burden you're trying to take on for society. That is clearly not the person that I was expecting to be sitting with in here today. Do you think your, your father would uh, approve of this, Basil? What do you think he would think about this road you've, you've chosen here? I actually thought I would be with him by now. I thought that the way things would go, the OPP would just shoot me on site just to get me out of the picture. Because the OPP, especially the detachment, I've already told them that I'm going to sue them for what they've done to me and my family, the more that they could, and to simply have the option to shoot me would have been right up the alley. I believe that 100% got him out of the picture before he tells the truth. But even when I tell the truth, then you really want to hear it, do you? Because you all hide your brother. And I actually went to the Ottawa area hoping that it would be the Ottawa police. But what do they do? They bring me back and give me to the OPP. And it's been the OPP, mostly the Killaloo detachment, that has been not my nightmare. Well, I'm here listening to what the truth is, and I'm with the OPP. But you've already told me that, oh, it's just dropping the back, and it's how the system works. So you're, even though you know it's crap, you said that you know it's crap. <laughs> I, I think maybe now you're, you're putting words in my mouth. No, no, I'm, I'm repeating what you said. You said that you know that women use the, the system. That's correct. Yet, you're not going to do anything about it. You think it's just a drop in the bucket. Then you said the system works. The system doesn't work. And if some people like me are in jail, that means the system doesn't work. When you put innocent people in jail, things happen. Screws get loose. You can't think. You're not, there's, the positivity of life is gone. Don't that doesn't seem to be the case with you, though, Basil. I mean, you've been to jail, and you can think very clearly. You're very articulate. You're very spiritual. So that didn't happen to you. You don't think so. I've been trying to. You call a Kevin Rinkowski. I tried to get the crisis line. I tried. I talked to my probation. I've been telling everybody I'm going to explode. It's overload. 
I don't know what's happening. I've been telling people that I've had dizzy. I can't, uh, uh, I, if I bend over and I sit up, everything starts spinning. I have health issues that haven't been dealt with. In jail, twice I was in jail, twice I asked them to fix the hernia. They told me, no, you do it when you get out. It's your responsibility. Many times, oh, I haven't got time, I haven't got money, I don't have a vehicle, I don't have everything that's been taken from me. So, well, lots of things, lots of things have been taken from you, apparently. Everything has been taken from me. Rightfully or not, this is a man who feels like he has been pushed to the edge and beyond. At a minimum, it needs to be investigated what organization or helpline he called and make sure they actually did everything they could. I had money. I used to make over 100000 a year in the 1990s. Everything has been taken from me. My job, my health, my family, my dignity. You all lost by the police and people that use the police. You, That's the you lost many things. I've lost everything. Do you think it's a little bit selfish on your behalf to take those women's lives for you to prove a point? To prove a point. Selfish? I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, I am going to prove right now what you're saying. Well, these women that you killed is part of a grand scheme to draw, for you to draw light on the fact that the justice system apparently doesn't work. No, it's not a scheme. Where are you getting this from? There's no scheme. I told you, I don't, I was reading the Bible, talking to this lady. I went to bed. I remember discussing with her parts of the Bible. Yes. I haven't slept in days. I'm sure that happened. I guess I'm have, not allowed to talk. We have I'm witnesses okay. that are going to fill in the rest of those yes. blanks, Basil. That's why you're here right now under arrest, okay? I'm sure you were talking to some woman about the Bible one night this week, but I'm also sure that you killed those three girls before you went to the park. I'm talking about the night before. The night before is what I'm talking about. And, and you, you but what I'm saying is there's no confusion about what happened to those women. I don't understand why I'm not allowed to tell the story. I don't understand it, but whatever. That's more corruption. Don't let him say what. No, no, I've been listening to you for like uh, two hours now to tell your story. And I only had one question. The only one I asked was, do you think it was selfish on your part to kill these girls just to prove your point? And more importantly, do you really believe your father would approve of that behavior? The question doesn't even make sense. It does not bear you. It's, it's the question on everyone's mind right now. So everyone in Ontario is going to want to know the answer to that question. Do you remember when I told you earlier that when you explain Good your question. situation that people develop an appreciation for why something may have happened, and perhaps they can see themselves in that same situation. And perhaps basically there's going to be people who have looked on your actions and thought, you know what, there's a trailblazer. There's a guy trying to make Ontario better by drawing attention to a problem. The median I don't believe is the best way you went about it, but I can certainly understand your frustration and what you're trying to do. You don't understand. I'm not going about anything. I'm not trying to get the medium or whatever you're talking about, or, or I'm not uh, whatever the word is used. Uh, you know every word I'm using. You're a very intelligent guy. I'm trying mind. to remember the word you're using. Used. Uh, what was the word you used? I'm not sure which one you're talking about. You're saying that I... Uh, I'm saying that you're mad at the justice system and you want to try and fix it by going about it this way. No. Draw the attention to it. Maybe so it doesn't happen again. It seems to be some motivation of yours. No. no. That's my understanding of what you've been saying in your well, last two hours. Your understanding is completely wrong. That's not what I'm doing. I didn't do something to motivate or whatever you're saying no you said justice this is justice you wanted justice you haven't got justice in fact you feel like attracted by justice so you've taken justice into your own hands and these three women are dead and whatever high and mighty spiritual motivation you talk yourself into at the end of the day you kill three women they are no longer with us you and i are here and people are going to make decisions about you and i appreciate 
that you've taken the time to explain your position to me because I think that's going to help the community understand. Because what they don't want is to think that there's just some serial killer out there running around. Because that's really what it comes down to. You're a guy who's killed three women, more than two, three is serial. But you've got this righteous side and there seems to be some sense of I need justice and Ontario needs justice and I've been a uh, taking it, kicking all the while from the justice system. And I've had enough. And I'm going to show everybody that this isn't right. There's consequences. That's very clear from everything that you've been saying here this whole time. People might feel that they are safe from a serial killer, but knowing his reason isn't going to make them feel totally safe. Everyone knows a Barutsky or someone very similar. Cases like this only make people wonder how close someone they know is to snapping. If you say that this happened because I was going to change the justice system, you oh, are so... Oh, oh, I think I think we both know that it can't be changed. You just want to draw attention to the fact that it's flawed. It can't be changed. Well, it all comes back to the very simple question of why this happened. So why did this happen? Next? We're having two different conversations here at the same time. I'm talking to you about being a police officer and you know it's wrong. You don't try to change the system. Me. I've got nothing to do with changing the system. This is your time. What is it you want to draw people's attention to? What What is it, Basil? I don't want to draw people's attention to anything. You certainly, you certainly have. You certainly have I drawn attention. I want them to be left alone. I'm going to suggest that so killing so three women is not the way to be left alone, my friend. I, I have nothing left. You stuck everything. Well, they've taken things from you, yes. And no. that's why I say... Use, use, use. Your brother would have. Me? No, I've taken nothing from you. No, the police have. If the police would have done a proper investigation okay. at any point, any time, and proved, instead of trying to prove that I was guilty when I was not, I want to know more proof when I was innocent, nothing would have ever evolved to this point. Couldn't possibly. I want to know more about this investigation you're talking about. I'm going to go and give this to my partner and have her pull out the report because I want to see it, okay? I don't know what you're talking about now. Which the, the, the Kathy Cernovsky one. Well, why just that one? Why not look at Well, no, I've got the other names here. Look at ten of them. All right. Can I have some can water, I, please? Yeah, I was just going to say, can I get you some, you want some water or anything else? Some water would be fine. Okay. There won't be long days. Time now is approximately 11.45. I'm turning off the audio recorder as I stepped out of the room. Time now is approximately 11.46, and I'm just returning the audio recorder to the room. I'm just going to get rid of some of this stuff here. Are you done with this stuff here, Hazel? Yeah, so you water. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to grab that right now. Let's see what's in your way. O'Neill has left for a few minutes, and Barutsky remains in almost the exact same position that he has adopted for most of the interview. He is tired and in pain. 
and when he isn't experiencing the adrenaline rush he gets while telling his story, he seems almost unable to hold himself up. It is only a few minutes before O'Neill returns to continue the rest of the interrogation. He appears just as fresh as when they first started, while Barutsky looks quite worn down. Barutsky would do better to insist on a lawyer or remain silent at this point, but he doesn't give the impression that he's very concerned with the outcome. Hit the men's room. You were confusing my 20 or whatever year history of bad from the cops, bad uh, publicity, bad uh, interactions, interactions from the police or lack of action on the police parts. And on my behalf, you know, with what happened, and you're wrong. You're thinking that I've done this to get uh, to promote change or something. That's I was trying to tell you that I don't even understand. I was reading the Bible and talking to a lady. The last thing I remember was. She went home, I read a little more of the Bible, and I remember talking to her about many different things. And she said that she liked the way I explained it and that I should actually teach or something. And uh, she, she's a nice older lady. And when was that? The night before. And I was talking to her about the part where the Ten Commandments and she said it's thou shalt not kill and I said no if you look in the newer Bible it'll say thou shalt not kill in the old original Bibles it's thou shalt not murder and I explained to yeah, her I made that same I keep talking, talking. Uh, I'm only going to talk because I lose my train okay. of thought sorry I explained to her that if it said thou shalt not kill, it would mean not be able to kill an animal for food or whatever. For various reasons people kill, kill for sport, kill for food, you kill for whatever. And uh, I said that's why it's murder. And I said uh, when you kill a murder, it's killing something murdering is killing something innocent and uh which i i'm poor how do you ever say the word i hate child molesters i hate what happened to my ex-wife i know that that destroyed her that she never had a life i know that that played a big part in what he done to her has played out on me as the bad guy. And then so it just keeps rolling, rolling. I understand that. I've uh, read every psychology book I could to try to help her. But after 27 years of abuse from her, or her seeing me as abusive because I'm trying to help her, and her family wanting to hide their family secret because that's what they call it. Your mother and father are finally dead. Your father would have liked to have that come out. The mother did not. 
And uh, there is a Bruce Sawbridge police officer from Kildo. You know where he lives? I think you told me his name. Yeah. I never told his name today or ever. Bruce? Bruce Sawbridge. I did not ever say that today. Well, there's somebody from Kildo. Bruce. Oh, yeah, it was Miller from Kildo. I don't know what Miller's first name. Anyway, I, I, Sawbridge told me that my ex-wife's two sisters went in and complained that they had been molested or whatever by their brother, but my ex-wife never did because she probably can't deal with it. At one point she thought that I was, by wanting her to go get help or admit it, that I was humiliating her and far from what I wanted. I would have stood behind her, even if to this day, if she ever, it's too late now, but if, if she ever admitted the truth, and I would stand behind her all the way. Because she's a drug addict, uh, alcoholic, she's everything there is. Barutsky keeps making himself out to be some sort of long-suffering saint, thanklessly trying to save the lesser veins around him. O'Neill hasn't called him on it, but he has to be biting his tongue at the level of insufferable arrogance. And all she has to do is tell the truth, and she, she won. I'm sure she'd get over all of it. She's making her own, her own self sick. My, my kids think I hate her. I've never hated her ever. Never. Not even now. After all the things she's done to me, I don't hate her. Never did. Even the police, everybody thinks that I, I never, I never beat her, I never hit her, I never put her down. Even though, even the judge, one judge, thought that, how did he say I was? I was just trying to tell the truth. I wasn't trying to humiliate her. Or, God, oh my, what a stupid. Who's, who's this woman you're having the spiritual discussion with? Elizabeth Rakoski, she just moved into the building. She's an older lady, her husband. Well, not that old, 60. I don't know. Probably nine, ten years ago or something. What, is this your building or where is this happening? The building where I live. Sorry, the building? Where I live, Palmer Rapids. Okay. I live with the... Palmer Rapids it, is a Crooked Park slide. Is that Palmer Rapids? Palmer Mare. Palmer Mare, yeah. I, I, I used to live out that way 15 minutes away. Okay. So this is happening in Palmer Rapids. So we were talking, and I guess whatever I, our end conversation was, when I fell asleep, I must have cramped about it. Or, I hadn't slept. I kept telling everybody in that building that I am tired. I hadn't slept in days. Everything was going anywhere. But, and I was talking to the crisis people. I'm trying to get help. And somebody, I need somebody to talk to. And nothing. I got no one. I didn't even talk to. My probation officer was one of the best ones for trying to help me. But that was not even her job. And I ended up with basically nothing anyway. And uh, I kept telling him, I'm going to explode. I can't handle it anymore. Everything is too much. I never dreamt that. I never dreamt that uh, this would happen. Anything can happen under stress, Basil. Anything. So we were talking about the Bible, and I remember we talked about all kinds of things in there about what was a f f fruit and it's not an apple, everybody believes it's an apple in the Bible. We talked about when Noah's Ark, how many animals went on, and she said two, and I said, that's wrong. Look in the Bible, there's two of every dirty animal, and seven of every clean. And I, and I, when I have a Bible, I'm quite willing to just look and show you, and prove to you. And we talked about why do people, everybody thinks there was two. Why isn't it real? Why do we believe what the priest or the pottery or people, how come nobody reads the Bible for himself and knows as a fact? And it's just like in life, everybody uh, believes what you hear. <laughs> nobody wants to make sure that it's true. That's what happened to me. Uh, they, uh, 
the system, the police, they believe the lies. It all piles up on, piled up on me as being the bad guy. Then the next person comes along and all they have to do is just mention Basil Brisky in the police army because there's a big pile of bullshit lies. Oh, I don't think you're a bad guy, Basil. It doesn't matter what you think. I'm talking about the past and how we got to here. You're here. I'm talking about back there and back there, the other police people that were involved, how one jumps on the other's back and and it comes to the point where there is no injustice for Basil, regardless of what happens, what he says, it'll just get worse and worse. And I guess you give up and you, and the stress level comes. And anyway, all I remember was going to sleep, or I don't even remember going to sleep. And then I woke up and I don't even know if I drank coffee. I just went out of the house and I remember at one point thinking about a zombie and and, uh, and I remember I was confused and I, 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 I remember seeing the Our Father, he had married over and over and over and I was driving and I, I said, I was talking to myself out loud, or I think I was, maybe I wasn't, but I, I kept saying, God, keep me safe, show me what to do, or stuff, or, and uh, I don't know what, I don't. The gun, I had the gun two years ago, when Carl Culleton and I first got together, and I was living on a farm, I found the gun in the scrapyard in an old motor home that was hidden under the floorboards. After rambling for a bit, Barutsky gets back on track and begins to give more pertinent details, such as how he ended up with the shotgun. Barutsky was not allowed to own weapons after his previous charges, so this explains how he was able to slip it under the radar. And I was pulling, I forget how I found it, I was pulling, looking for something and I, I found the shotgun. And then I collected shells out of every car that's well, not every car, but I get two out of this car, three out of kind of country atmosphere, and I was living near a scrapyard next door. I collected the shells, if you look at them half and they're rusted, and I don't even know if they And that was because at that time Carl would visit me there at the farm, and the police would drive by and they'd shine lights, stop in front of the house, shine lights in my windows, and it was freaking Carl out, and it kind of destroyed our. And I was totally honest with her. I told her my whole history, and and uh, and she knew I was going to Anastasia to work on the house to help her so she could get money to pay Eric. But Anastasia twisted that around to make it look like we were in a relationship so that she wouldn't have to pay because the whole thing was in the end. I told Anastasia, that's it, I'm out of here, you're not even trying to get the house, what do you call that, appraised. And I told her I'm going back and reestablishing myself with Carl because me and Carl had drifted away a bit because I wasn't. And Anastasia went ballistic, locked me out of the house, bare ass in the middle of winter. Party below, I'll never forget that. It was one of the coldest nights. And then when I finally got in the house, she just laughed. I asked her, why did you do that? She's like a psycho person. Just um, Basil, I'm confused about one thing here. I hope you can clarify for me. I'm confused. I'm, the, I, I'm, wishing, I'm wishing I could figure this out. The information we have, Carol Culleton, uh, did you, our information is you just met her in September, is that not correct? No. Through the Wilsons? No, the Wilsons. I don't even know them. I, went, I met the Wilsons to Carol. So how long have you known Carol for? Approximately three years. Before. And are you, are you in a relationship with her? Yes. Carol and I had sex, no problem. OK. 
Oscar, when I went to help Anastasia, Anastasia tried, she walked around me and she tried and I couldn't. I went and told the doctor there's something wrong with me. <laughs> this young whatever struts around, she even in the hot would sit on my lap and nothing. And he, my doctor told me, Basil, all the things that have happened with women with you, it's psychological, it, she's like a daughter to you and, and, uh, and it never happened. The doctor gave, even gave me, or I, I or because I thought I'm there's something severely wrong with me, and it didn't even work. It didn't work. And then I thought it was because of my hernia, that was my thing, and I don't know. But then when me and Carl went back together, it seemed to all work again. I don't understand. So me and Carl were apart at the time while I was in jail because Anastasia put me there. How long were you in jail for a bit? A year. When was that? I got out in January, so I went in in January. January of this year you got out? This past year. Okay. okay. So this conversation with uh, your neighbor, when, when is this happening? Today's Wednesday. So what are you having this, this spiritual conversation? Tuesday night. It has to be Tuesday. Today's today. Somebody else told me today's Thursday. Today, today's Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. So then Monday. Today's Wednesday. Tuesday. So then Monday night, me and uh, Elizabeth were talking. Okay. Monday. I don't remember. Even how, I remember at Natalie's walking from the house to the vehicle, and I remember thinking like uh, I was beside myself, or like a zombie, or not there. I had the weirdest feeling walking from. I don't remember. I don't know. And then I drive, and I'd say, "Where do I go, God?" And I. Barutsky's version of his relationship with Carol doesn't match up with what statements were made to the police by her friends. Is he deliberately lying? Has he honestly bought into his own delusion of events? Or has Carol been embarrassed about her relationship with someone with so many issues and lied about it to her friends? O'Neill, or more accurately, the detectives involved directly in the case, will have to sort that out. I turn on this army and that army. And I didn't even know where I was going. I was in daycare and places. I, I had no idea. So what happened after you're talking to Elizabeth? What can you remember of that? Going to sleep. I don't even remember going to sleep. I don't know if I contacted reading the Bible or if I, which I do, I do read a lot and I fall asleep with it. And, and we had a drink. I had two, two rye, I remember that. And she had two beer, I gave her. Two beer, a butt apple, and a Coors Light, and that's it. What kind of ride was it? Forty Creek. It's oh, a good ride. And I, I don't drink much. It's a rare thing. And uh, I don't know. I I haven't slept in uh, probably five days. I only I remember sleeping like an hour in the middle of the afternoon and somebody phoned and woke me up and I looked and I figured it's about an hour of sleep I've got. But that's been going on for months. I'm getting it less and less and less. What's going on with that? You don't know, why is that happening? I don't know. And then, uh, then I go out and then I sleep for 20 hours straight and then it all starts again. It's been happening. That's why I told you I was trying to get Talk to. They call me crisis line, Terry. Terry. What were you talking to them? Is it? It's wrong. It's not. Now I lost that. Or Rakowski, my probation person. Would know that person's name. 
It's not terrible. And this is the crisis line person you're trying to think of. Yes, and they were supposed to get the mental health worker. I wanted to talk to somebody, and I kept telling everybody that I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm gonna blow here like there's some. But I didn't think this was. Uh, I thought blow was I was gonna go apeshit, uh, scream and yell like a mm -hmm. retard in the field or something. I felt like my head was gonna blow off. That's what stress is. And then, Basil. but as far as that uh, day, other than I had a pad of paper and then, and I wanted to get out of this area. I wanted, because I wanted to get away from the uh, Killaloop OPP. And I thought I was going to go to Ottawa. I don't know what I thought because everything was just snapping in my head. Like, I don't know why. Uh, when you woke up after finally getting some sleep Monday, what can you remember about that? I don't even know if I. You're saying when I woke up Tuesday. Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't know. I don't know if you woke up Monday night or Tuesday morning. I don't know. I don't even know if I slept or if I did. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't even know when I left. Oh, yes, I do. I, I left around 8 o'clock or no earlier. I think I made coffee. I normally just wake up around five every day, regardless of if I sleep two hours, I, it's five o'clock. Okay. It just is. So where did you go when you woke up? I went. I believe I went to the gas station in Palmer Gulix and I sat there because they weren't open and then there was no gas in the car or very little. Do you have your own your own vehicle? No, I borrowed a car off of Cheryl. There are two possibilities here, both of them equally plausible. The first option is that Barutsky has some sort of mental health episode, which built up over time and help didn't occur soon enough to prevent three tragic deaths. The second option is that Barutsky is making a calculated attempt to get off completely, or have the charges reduced on some type of insanity plea. Either way, he'll obviously need to be checked out by a mental health specialist before he stands trial. Okay. It was like a nightmare, or not a nightmare, a dream, or a... I remember it saw me. Where'd the gun come from? Scrap here, and, uh, and uh, I, uh, I thought I was going to protect myself from the police. The police were shining lights and were sitting in front of the house. And I, I, uh, I'm telling you, that it's either post traumatic or I, uh, I said, uh, it could be with somebody. And I see it. Uh, this was back when I was with Natalie. I used to tell her to turn here because there's a police car. They're going to get off the road and hide and. What, what do you mean you felt like a zombie? What, what was going on there? Like, a, like I was beside myself, like I was looking at this from over there. I could see myself. Uh, that's the way it was. I thought I could see myself walking. From over there. Over, forward, beside. Myself. But what did you see yourself doing? Walking. 
from the first to the car. I remember, I don't know, I really don't. I still don't know. I don't know if I have to get more sleep. If I have to, I don't know. I just know that something. Um, and then I started writing after. It's a good thing I started writing. What you write? I don't know. I can't remember. Stuff. You just have the pad. You felt like a zombie before? No. No, that's why I thought, or that's why I remember. I thought it was weird, like uh, the word zombie came into my head. But uh, it wasn't, I don't know what a zombie is. It was like, I remember like as if I was over there looking at myself walking. I don't know if this makes sense, but it's, that's what I mean. What do you remember after the walking? Not much. I remember being in a car. I remember saying, God show me. There you go. And I remember saying, Your Father, every little while, not incessantly, but every 10 minutes, maybe, or something, or I don't know, I don't know. I just know I said it a lot. What was God telling you to do? What was He telling you? He, I believe that God was telling you where to turn, because I was driving on roads that I didn't even know where they were going. I remember being in Dacre and I was wondering, what the hell am I doing here? And then in a bunch of little towns. And, uh, I remember I pulled into some little, like a park, roadside park place, and I would go around in a circle. And then I drove back out on the highway. And I remember saying, I don't understand why you wanted me to do that, but there must be a reason. And that would have been, I don't know where that was. O'Neill asks a few questions and does an excellent job of hiding his own opinion about Barutsky's honesty. Getting details on exactly what Barutsky was thinking and feeling will be helpful in a mental evaluation. And if he is lying, any contradictions could trip him up later. What did, what happened at Carol's? Can you remember that? At the cottage? I remember, I was at the cottage the night before. On Tuesday. You said today's Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. So you were arrested yesterday afternoon in Ottawa. That if that helps. Tuesday. I was arrested. Yes. So Monday, I was at the college. And that's when Carl was, I already knew about her and the other, she had told me, but that's when she, That's when she said that uh, her and her man called me BF. And she said that uh, they thought it was funny. And uh, he kept texting her. And she was laughing in the house. And she, uh, she, kept, she told me that they had this joke about me being BF best friend the guy that would do anything until she asked for nothing or whatever. Why would she tell you that? Why would she try to hurt you like that? I asked her that. I asked her in my text to her, I asked her, why would you hurt me like that? I 
don't know. She wouldn't tell you. She never told me in my texts when I asked her. She never, she laughed. And then she, I don't even know the guy's name, never asked. When she first told me that she was with him, she said that it, she couldn't live like that. And that was it. I never asked no more questions. So she told me he was younger. I don't know how old, I don't know his name. I don't know because it wasn't in the court and I thought it was in her past. And it wasn't. But when you saw her in person, she wouldn't tell you? Tell me why. Why she decided to hurt you like that? She never told me. She just said, we joke around and laugh about this. We call you my BF. And then she said, best friend. And it's more or less like they talked. I threw her cell phone out of the car somewhere because it was ringing. Uh, I never even looked at her stupid cell phone, but it probably had uh, stuff there. Obviously, it would. God, I wish I had a smoke. You smoke, do you? Yes. Sean, can see if I can eat one of these? I love one. I chain smoke. Nervous. How do you how do you feel right now? I don't know. I'm tired and confused and I'm trying to make sense of this and uh, I know what I remember Monday, if you said that it was Tuesday, it was Monday. Well, it could have been, I don't know when you were at Carol's Cottage, if it was Monday night or Tuesday. Monday is when you were talking to Elizabeth. The same day I was there at the cottage and in the evening I came home and I was talking to Elizabeth. I was at the cottage, I came from there. Did you go back there after talking with Elizabeth? Oh, I don't think so. Barutsky is pretty incoherent about the timeline. While the autopsies will be able to pin down the time of deaths fairly accurately, unless there are witnesses, it will be almost impossible to know if he was at any of the houses earlier in the day or a day or two before. And it seemed, I would ask him, God, show me what to do. And I remember it was, I don't know if I've seen a light or seeing it in my head. Why would, why would God have you kill those women? Okay, so that seems kind of counterintuitive. Uh, no. What reason could there be for that? No, to me it seemed like it seemed like that God was trying to show me that the commandment isn't thou shalt not kill, it is thou shalt not murder, and that when somebody it's murder to kill somebody that's innocent, that's why I couldn't kill myself because I thought about shooting myself and do that because I am innocent, I didn't do it wrong. Because that would be me murdering myself. I don't, does that make any sense? It does. And uh, so Carol 
And so, no, the way you're saying it would be counterintuitive, no, it seems that I understand it, that that's what God was saying was the right thing to do. So, in terms of Carol and Anastasia and Natalie, would you say you killed them or murdered them? I killed them because they were not innocent. They were guilty. I was innocent. I done nothing wrong. So in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. Almost inevitably, Barutsky has used the God told me to do it excuse. Whether God or the devil, many people choose one or the other because they are unable to accept accountability for their own actions. Pushing it off on a higher power or supernatural force distances them from their actions and absolves them from guilt. And it doesn't make sense, does it? No, it does make sense. Especially when you talk about the, the change in, in diction with the Bibles, right? Murder versus kill. The change in... Well, remember when they changed the Bible from the initially like the King James, it was murder and then they changed it to kill? I don't know why they changed it. Some Bibles say kill, I know the old ones all say murder. That's all I mean. Yeah. I don't know. But it makes sense to me because if it said, I believe the Bible is perfect. If the Bible said... Thou shalt not kill. We couldn't eat meat. <laughs> that made it simple as that. Because the Bible is literal. It means what it says. It's not like us people that, you know, people say something and it means absolutely. So when you say that Natalie and uh, Anastasia and Carol are not innocent, it's because of all these wrongdoings they did to you over the years, that stealing everything that you have. That's where the innocence and is. And lying to the police to achieve. I didn't lie. It's all about lies. Not about the money and the things. It's lying. I will not lie. If I do tell a lie, it's to protect somebody, like my daughter, or, or I will avoid. And that's a lie to avoid sometimes. But it's always to... Basically, you you tell me that you don't lie, and you would only lie if you were protecting somebody from. Uh, Which I would call. Yeah. Lie. Are you lying to me when you say you don't remember how you killed those women? When you're talking about this zombie and seeing outside yourself and God telling you, are I you never, lying? To I me? never told you that. What did you say? When you tell me that you don't remember clearly what's happening after you left Elizabeth. Remember you talked about, you said you feel like a zombie? Yeah. And you don't remember everything? Are you lying about that? I never said I don't remember. I, I don't, I'm not, I think you're putting words in Oh no, no I'm not, this is the last thing I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to clarify what you're saying. That's all I want to do. I do not want to put words in your mouth. I just want to understand what you're saying. I'm not lying about zombie. I'm not lying about driving. I'm not, okay. I'm not lying about praying. I'm not li lying about asking. God will show me where to go. And because and, I wondered why I'm in Dacre and, and wherever I was, I don't remember Dacre. And Did you want to you asking me? <coughs> Am I lying about when you said you felt like a zombie and you couldn't remember? No, I'm not lying. Okay. I'm telling that's you. All, that's all I was asking you. No, you just said more. You asked me if I was you were putting words. That's not what you asked me. You asked me if I remember. If you do remember everything. I don't remember everything, not yet. Okay. I think that uh, some, I remember more this morning 
I mean, sure as hell ain't last night because I, yeah. when I, that guy wanted to talk to me, I called him the phone. I said, I don't even want to talk to you. I don't even want to listen. I'm so tired. And he said, well, then hang up the phone. I don't know what he said. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know lots of things because we've been talking for a while now and clearly you're doing a great job of remembering some things and you're understanding what I'm saying. And, you're aware that you can talk to a lawyer at any time. So, I mean, you're, you're clearly with me in the moment right now, I would say. Um, I don't think I'm clearly in the moment with you right now. I don't think that I, uh, I'm, uh, I don't think I told you for weeks, months maybe, I've been telling everybody I'm going to blow or explode, or and it feels like my head is so full of things, and, and nobody listens, and I feel like I'm all... Well, what kind of things was it full of? I just told you, I feel like I'm alone, or I'm, there's nobody helping me, and, and over and over, and uh, those things, what I'm telling you is what I'm talking about, and, and uh, panic, and Feelings of loss, hurt, I would guess, by what you're describing. I think if somebody was laughing no, at me, you like hurt or no, I had not the hurt is only in the last few after letting him speak extensively, O'Neill presses the matter by asking Barutsky if he's being honest. Unsurprisingly, this upsets Barutsky, and he accuses O'Neill of putting words in his mouth, which happens to be a classic gaslighting technique used by an abuser being questioned by their victim. I think Carol laughing at you with your boyfriend would hurt You're anybody. No, I'm talking about in the last month or longer, or two months, I've been telling people in this book. I may have felt hurt in the last four, five days. Okay. But not because hurt wasn't part of it, it was alone. I've been thinking a lot about how alone I am in this world and that I'm thinking about how police took everything away on me and my family and my brothers and sisters. Because I realized that even my own family, they have doubts about Basil now. Like, and there's a, I have, I don't blame them because it's so much, it's overload, and I guess overload is what's happened to me. And uh, No, I don't even feel like my family treats me like part of the family anymore. Do you remember when I told you earlier when we started talking that that's why but my I family, but my family, family but my family, my family has seen my ex-wife do crazy things, like see devils coming through walls, like sleeping with my cousin at my brother's wedding, like um, lots of stuff. But my family has never come forward. When my wife does crazy things and, uh, uh, and blames them on me and accuses me, my family has never come forward and said, she's the one that's nuts, she's done this. There's mm -hmm. they've never ever came to and not taking your side. They they don't, and Marianne brings a whole always brought a whole barrage of her family, her mother, her uh, and sister, and they're all hiding the big family secret that they have a brother that is, is a pedophile and, and I always look like the well, that would certainly explain why you feel alone all the time, basically. People in your own family treating you like that. Well, they, it's not that they're treating me like that. It's just that they don't want to get involved. And they, I don't know. But it has evolved to the point now where I think if they would have in the beginning, the very first time, uh, my wife one time took her top off in the car with my brother and my brother actually came back and told me that was good. I then 
But another brother saw my wife screwing my first cousin, who was his buddy, in the car. He never told me until seven years later. That's not good. It's better to know the truth. It's the, he, he taught more of his cousin than me, his own brother. Can't get caught in the truth, right? You can't get caught in the truth. That was my dad saying. Have you ever heard that before? Just because you told me your dad told you that. Have right? you ever heard that before? I can't say that I have, no. Does that make sense yeah, to you? It makes perfect sense, yeah. Especially in my line of work, right? I have lived by that one my life. I can tell you firsthand, that's exactly how people get themselves in trouble lying. Getting caught in the lies. But the problem is people don't get themselves in trouble lies. People lie about people to hide what they do. And that would be my ex-wife, this Laura Lee Kelly. And there's some men that don't know everything you're gonna think for women because there's men out there that have stuck knives in my back. But it's always, and it always goes back to money. And again, right from the Bible, even that night I was reading to that lady about money is not, uh, I can't remember the words, but I just know the feeling I have had that. And I, believe this or not, I am poor, filthy poor. I live at 850 a month. I had a little bit of RSPs and things, cash in the side. I don't even know how I ever done it this last long lasted with Carl I tried to tell her that money means nothing to me she at one point said to me this is my cottage she kind of took offense that I had done so much work there because I had built a deck without asking her I surprised her I thought it was like a gift and I connected two decks stuff like that so we had a little she thought that I was taking over and we got over and I told her, I said, okay, I want to start on the projects. I'm sorry, it was a gift, but whatever. Uh, where was I going with that? Oh, money. I wanted, and Carol knew all about Anastasia and uh, Natalie. And my ex-wife was the same with the money and Laurie Kelly. And there's a few men in my life, which I don't want to even go into that, not gay, but men, things, dealings, things that, I've gotten the old dagger in the back from, I'll tell you, I don't care. Brutsky becomes louder and even more unfocused. He goes off on a tangent and then can't recall the point he was originally trying to make. The only thing he does seem to know for sure is that he likes to be the one doing the talking and barely lets O'Neill get a word in edgewise. When I was driving around, I went to Natalie. You're really going to hear it now. I remember this. When I was with Natalie, there's a big fat guy. I have no idea what his name is. He owns a sawmill in White Lake. I found out through the grapevine. All I know is the fat guy, or the big guy. Natalie was buying the backhoes from the big fat guy, and he always came with a nephew. And lots of times, Natalie would tell me to go out because the guy, it was for, he said he wanted a little peewee eggs for his sister. So, so we say small eggs. This is, I don't know, a couple of years back. Natalie somehow got a dealer going through him, told me that she leased a backhoe from Quebec. The backhoe was on the farm. I can't remember the how much she told me that the backhoe cost per month, but it seemed awfully cheap. But anytime I would say anything. She talked French to on the phone. I don't know who she was talking to. And then she had papers that were in French and she told me this was an, uh, 
What happened to Natalie's actor, Carol's? Then uh, Natalie, after Natalie put me in jail for saying that I was going to hang the kid, which I did not do, never intended to, never even crossed my mind. She, I'm in jail. She continued to sell backhoes and she flaunted to one, drove it around. I knew then that it was stolen. She, she had a boy driving around and leave it in the field. They were trying to, and anyway, the police went there and found some stuff. But this other man, Jimmy McClement apparently, moved four backhoes. I always found out this stuff from the farm. They were being delivered to the back of the farm for two New Holland, yellow, some other. Anyway, Natalie tried to put the blame on me when police finally came and found that backhoe. Natalie called the guy and told him, I am in the clear. She put the finger blamed on me. Natalie, she doesn't make Natalie is not innocent. That's very clear in all this, from what you're telling me. Part right. that I don't understand is why did the police go there? They found the stuff there. I am in jail, so I couldn't possibly have anything to do with this. But instead of charging her or looking into it, she got off with nothing. And when I got out of jail, they started watching me because they thought that I was some sort of a kingpin in a stolen back or ring. <laughs> and the funny thing is, the, I will never forget this, this Bruce Savage cop was the guy, he called me, he said, Basil, you know how this goes, do you want me to surround the place or do you want me to just come and pick you up at the farm, whatever. I said, well, uh, just come pick me up. And I'm talking to him and I realized, I didn't even know why he was there. And I thought, this is probably about those stupid stolen backhoes. And we were, I was at the car and I said to him, can I go back to the house to get something? And he said, no. He said, can I send uh, my partner to get it? If he would have let me go back, I wanted to go back and grab that lease paper that Natalie said was the, from the, the backhoe. And because I thought that's what it was about. I thought I was going to be charged with something to do with the backhoes that Natalie, and uh, it was nothing to do with that. Even though I, by that time I knew that that, that backhoe was stolen. Because mm -hmm. I told her, I got it out of the concrete, how I done it. I said, there's something wrong here, Natalie. It's too cheap or to, wow, how could that company make money? Uh, Brutsky has gone way off topic, and every time O'Neill tries to nudge him back on track, Brutsky shuts him down and continues talking about whatever he wants to discuss at the time. O'Neill is being exceedingly patient, but at some point he'll have to take a firmer hand if he wants this to go anywhere. But then anyway, when I'm in jail, I know for a fact, and if the police wanted to figure it out, they all they had to do was go to the neighbor because there's a, a garage next door, and I'm sure the neighbor must have seen the backhoes leaving that property because they'd have to drive it right or float them right past. Uh, yeah. But they didn't. They didn't want to. Nobody wanted to prove that Basil's innocent. They wanted to prove, find a way to make Basil guilty instead of. And then Natalie laughed about it and told him one of the. I said, if I caught her one that she was in the clear. And then, then I got a letter from her lawyer saying that it, when I got out of jail, that if I wanted to collect my tackle and some little stuff, I was supposed to contact the OPP. So they were trying to get me to go and say that I couldn't believe it. Like, how. I don't know if the police put the lawyer up to that. I don't know what the real thing. Basil, after all this stuff has happened, the one thing I want to ask you, did you want the police to kill you? Yeah. Because then I'm going to have to kill myself. 
because then you wouldn't be going against, right? The only thing I, I understand that line of thinking, you explained that very well. The only thing I don't understand is the note that you left for the police in the Ottawa area saying that you don't have a gun, don't shoot me. What that kind of goes against that. Why did because that happen? Because at that time I had sat in about three different places and I had been writing and I thought that if I wrote it out as, and, and for me, when I was writing it, it, I thought this is the most clear thing I've ever done was try to write it and it made sense. And I thought maybe, maybe I shouldn't die. Maybe I should, maybe I ask. I was still a little bit in the beginning of God there. I thought God was helping me write it. God took me there, God took me. And I thought that maybe I should stay alive and that, no, there was more. I remember thinking, if I'm dead, who will explain this or something? I don't know. And then I decided I put the gun down first, and then I walked a little piece, then I wrote on one page, and I hung it on a branch. Don't murder me, I'm... Wait, well, exactly right, there was no one to explain, right? I have no gun or something, I can't remember what I wrote. And then I night. But up until that point, I was hoping that if I can just let me know I would do uh, I was actually hoping when a helicopter flew over that. It's in a torpedo now. So what is it you think you're left here to explain, Basil? What is it you want to, what's your message in all this? It is no message, it's vindication would have been. But you're you're not following me here. There's two things. <laughs> it's like me walking, being the zombie, and me over here looking at the zombie. It's like two a lot of what I'm telling you is history of twenty years got to here. And, and then there's the zombie part. So the guy watching the zombie, the zombie is me. The guy that's watching the zombie is how I got here. The 20, does that make sense to you? The 20 years of my ex-wife where, from where it started to... There's always a reason why something happens. Does right? that make any sense? Of course it is. There's always a reason why things happen. And you get 20 years of reasons. As I think you tried to explain here today. And I, uh, I know a nut cracked or something, or <laughs> that doesn't make sense. I never experienced a zombie or the. Suicide by cop is an uncommon, and in itself, it's a tragic decision to make. But as in Barutsky's case, many of those who can't bring themselves to take their own life seem to have no problem killing several other people. Even the conflict of the letters isn't unusual. Many suicidal people change their mind, especially if they have time to wait to die. They start to worry that they'll feel pain or live through the event. These points can make it difficult to determine whether Barutsky is genuinely depressed and suicidal or if he is a stone-cold killer trying to work out a better deal for himself. I, uh, I don't even know how I just told you what I did. Well, because you tell the truth, that's what you do. No, but I can't even explain how it got to that. How did I ever figure out that? Do you remember what you did after you left Carol's? Of... Does that help? If you think about it like a chronology? When you left Carol's, and somehow you end up at Anastasia's. I just uh, left Carol's and I said, God, what do I do? And I just... I remember 
going to a little bit of construction. And I just drove in. And I remember thinking that God is really helping me because when I went to Carl's, Carl walked right outside. Mm -hmm. What did she do? And then I asked her, I said, why do you hate me? Or why are you doing this to me? And then she closed the door. I was right there. And then I broke the window with my elbow. And I opened, reached in and I unlocked the door. And she said, this is not you, Basil. This is not you. You know what happened? Then she told me that uh, Dave was coming over because the hydro was out. And I said, you're lying to me again. And there was a, a cable TV coil. I picked it up and I hit her with it and I wrapped it around her head. And she just kept saying, this is not you, Basil, this is not you. And then her, uh, then I walked around in the cottage. I dumped the bag on the table. Purse, maybe, or something. Brought her keys. I remember taking my cell phone because I thought I was going to read it to see who this guy was, but I never did. I ended up throwing it out the window. I remember throwing it. But that was already near the evil somewhere. Way right later. Ah. Take my hand for a second. For what? I just want to shake your hands. I want to thank you for being the guy that you said you are this whole time you've been here, a true vulgar person. It's a rare experience I get to meet somebody who actually walks to talk to Fritchie. Walks like what? Yeah. Well, you said you, eight, eight, nine out of ten, you're a truthful person. And you don't lie unless it's to protect somebody. Other than the little white lies. I'm not sure why. Well, that's what you're doing right now. You're being truthful. Doesn't matter. Why would it matter? What does it matter? Think about it. It's just like you say, you never get caught in the truth, right? As he speaks, Brutsky becomes quiet and almost monotone. It's like he's narrating something he has seen, but not actually participated in. O'Neill uses this time to repeat one of the sayings used by Barutsky's father to establish an emotional connection while Barutsky is vulnerable. You should remember that one. You should remember that. I'm going to. Everybody should remember that. I'm going to. Then, I don't know. Really don't you know what, maybe I'm really tired again, or maybe if I... Yeah. Do you want me to see about that smoke? I don't know that it would take away some of the... Okay, let me go and try and run one up for you. I won't be here that long as I was with the water. Do you want another water? Yes, please. Okay.
Okay, so smoke's coming. Just put it in front of some Phoenix or a toilet paper. Yep. Or can I go to the bathroom? Uh, yeah, just one second. Just let me sort out where it is and we'll go right if you're in a second. You're okay. Uh, Kleenex, you want? In piss. Yep. Okay, basically, we'll go to the bathroom next door if you want to hit the can and then I got to smoke for when you get back here. Come on, see all right? Cigarette right now. O'Neill breaks to allow Barutsky to use the restroom while he goes to get some cigarettes. It's a long interrogation, and Barutsky is more likely to continue talking if he is kept comfortable. Okay, Basil, here you go. I'm just gonna throw some water in that from the ashes. It wasn't just that day. It's your other days. A couple of days before it was maybe right through. Mm -hmm. Take your time, take a minute. Don't punch me, please. Brutsky is breaking down. Either reality is finally setting in, or he is being affected by the lack of sleep and is unable to control his emotions. I remember being behind myself, watching myself, walking to the car from the building. And it was like, I was over there. I went, I'm here, but the, the, this is from your building, these, as if I was watching from a camera. Myself. I should be talking to the psychiatrist. I don't know what the fuck is going on here. 
I remember this was days before, but that's what I remember seeing myself walking out of the building with the gun days. I had the gun in the apartment. I smuggled in because I thought that the police were going to come. I am. There's a, something wrong with me there. There's not something wrong with me. It's real. I am afraid of the fucking police. And I have good reason to be. So I brought the gun there because I thought that something was going to come and kick in my door. And I wasn't putting up it no more. I'm not fucking, I'm going to shoot the cocksuckers. Leave me alone. And then, I don't know why I wanted to take the gun out of the apartment because I don't know why. So I took it and I hid it in the bush in the garbage bag. But the soon as I, I wasn't doing that, I, I see myself doing that. Does that make sense? I was over there. I'm here. I'm like a camera and I can... Where did you, where did you lay in the bush, prison? Just along the road. But it's all fucked up. I'm sure that was, I don't think it was a week earlier. Days. Maybe not. I don't know. I know I done it. And I took those rusty old bullets. I hid them with. I didn't really hide it. I took them just in the bush. But... Where did you have the where did you have the bullets? With the gun. The gun was never loaded when it was in the house. Did you take the gun with you to Carol's? Yes. I took it everywhere with me then. Until I dropped it in the bush there. And that was only because I sat at that on a picnic table. No. Yeah. I was sitting at the picnic table and I was ready. And I felt at peace. I was quiet, alone, calm. Everything was nice. Started. I read all the time. If you go to my apartment, there's fucking rights everywhere. It's like that's why I talk to is paper. It doesn't make any fucking sense. No one listens to me. So nobody helps me figure out what I was, was the, the right thing to do. Like I'm telling the fucking truth to my divorce, to everything. I never lie and they listen to the fucking lies. So who do I talk to? Nobody. I fucking, that, that Rakowski, what the fuck is his name? I tried to tell him, he said, you don't want to do that, you don't want it. I don't want to fuck, I'm telling him my head's going to explode and he's not listening to me. Barutsky is unraveling and O'Neill remains calm throughout, seeing where this will lead. At any moment, Barutsky's mood might shift and he might decide to quit speaking, so O'Neill is opting not to break the flow. I kind of knew where I knew. I don't know what I fucking knew. I knew I needed help. I phoned the fucking. And I remember telling my probation lady that she was fucking more help to me than anybody that I fucking ever called because I never got replies or fucking. It was like. That's months ago, a long time ago. And I talked to my, tried to talk to get my daughter to come and talk to me. And we ended up getting a big fight because she, maybe I, I don't know, fuck. I probably can, me, I, I can't deal, couldn't deal with them, nothing anymore. It was, nobody 
fucking listens to me. Nobody helped me. Nobody. And I was not mine ever. The first, I remember, I remember the, oh my god, how the fuck did I do that? I took it to the bush, left it there for a day or two, maybe or three, I don't fucking know. Then, after, after the lady, me, were talking about the Bible, I tried to sleep, and I did not. Maybe I fell asleep, maybe I didn't. I don't know. That's when I went and got the gun. And I brought it back to the building, and I carried it. This is all me watching me do it. It's like over there. Does this make any fucking sense? Yes, it is. No, it doesn't. I carried it down by the garden shit. I was trying to get a garden going at the building because I wanted to fucking get some of those people there out of the apartments and fucking be a little friendlier. They're all fucking fighting like idiots. And anyway, I took it. I hit there in the bush again. I don't know why. And I remember thinking I shouldn't, but I did. Then I went to bed. I didn't go to bed and just laid on the couch and I fell asleep. I think, I don't. Mm -hmm. I was so fucking tired. I couldn't sleep. And you know what? I, I only. It's like bits. I remember driving the car, and I'm beside the car, not in the car. I'm outside the door, and I'm steering here, but the car is over. And it's and I remember, I remember God's helping me do what's right. I remember, I remember God saying, not saying God never spoke to me. I remember thinking that God's making this easy because Carl came out the door because when I got to Anastasia, she walked out the door. As soon as I walked out, I knew wasn't even at the door, she just walked out. And I asked Anastasia, I just said, why did you lie in court? And she said, I didn't. And the gun went off. Because it just lies. And I no. I very cheaply shot, dude. What do you mean? What part of her body? I have no idea. She, she ducked down. It was lying. Now that Brutsky has started to calm down, O'Neill quietly inserts a question about the second victim, and Brutsky follows along without giving it any thought. I don't know. Not behind the line. There was a little island. And she was standing and she just went down and the gun went off after she went down. So this is this is inside the house? Yes. Okay, because I'm sorry, because you said she'd come outside there. Yeah, but she, she went in and I walked in right behind her. Okay. It was as if it was supposed to be. It's like she opened the door right when I just come there and I just walked. She turned around and walked in and I walked right in behind her. And was anyone else there? 
there was another girl there. She, she had a toothbrush in her mouth and she, she said, who are you? I'll kill you. And that's all. What happened after that? I just, uh, again, I said, God, what do I do now? God told me to get in the car and drive down the highway, and I, I drove. Jiggity jaggedy through a bunch of back roads, somehow too often on the road. And then to the farm. Whose farm is this? It wasn't any of that. It was She lied. I paid into it in cash because I was going through a divorce, but because my wife was cuckoo all those years, I kept socking money away. And I have friends that for probably 10 years before I ever left the wife, I told them, when Sarah turns 18, I'm out of there. I gotta get away, I can't take it anymore. Sarah wasn't, I couldn't do it. Sarah was only 13 maybe. And I, I couldn't take her anymore. I just, everything I'd done was fucking wrong. Everything I'd done was negative, yet it was as positive. I remember building the chip truck for my daughter and my wife cursing me out and beating on me and slapping me in the face and I'd be crying and I'd, I never hit my wife. I fucking, she beat the shit out of me and I fucking walked up in the bush. I don't know how many times I stood there and met her and said, fuck it, it makes you feel better, go ahead. But after a while, years, I spent more time in the bush And the day that my wife came back, I told her, I lived in a fucking trailer. I built that house. I'm the only one that ever worked. And I moved out into a trailer on the property, a travel trailer. And I told my wife, I'm doing laundry. You go to my daughter's or our daughter's and stay there. I'm going to the house. I got to do laundry. I went up to do laundry. She left. I started doing laundry. She fucking comes back. I was, I knew what she was going to do. I knew, I felt it. She's one side of the house, I'm on the other. I run out the fucking door and lock myself in the garage. From my own wife, I'm a fucking man. I'm hiding from my wife. Because you cocksuckers would never listen to me. You don't fucking understand the man gets fucking beaten and he don't talk. He Clarity is fleeting, and once again Barutsky is rambling about the past. He accuses his wife of physically abusing him, which if true is horrible, but he also just might be saying this to make himself look like a tragic fewer. And I fucking believe me told you as many times, you've done nothing. Nothing. You have no idea how humiliating that is to stand there and take it, to be told you're no fucking good. To be told that the f guy she was with after she came back was a better man than you. A bum! And I took it. I never hit that woman. Anastasia, you think I'm a big guy who's all, uh, you put handcuffs on me like I'm some sort of a 
Fuck you, give me one little shot, and I'm on the ground, you can fuck have my cripple for fuck's sake. Anastasia beat the fucking shit out of me. I she burned all my fucking clothes. She burned my boots. She burned everything. She fucking Oh, I kept the house from burning down so many fucking times. She tried to, she was going to throw a can of acid. She was crazy. She's bipolar. I kept telling my daughter, I could come here. I got to get out of here. She won. I was trapped. She threatened to drink acetone. They got, got, yeah, oh, my old phone, if somebody would have kept it, it was on the phone that she was going to drink acetone. In court, she said that basil drive. I never drove. Only one time, because she got drunk. I was under suspension. She said, you drive, I'm going to drink. And we were at my brother-in-law from my brother's getting electrical stuff for her house. So I drove her home. In course, she said I drove. That was a lie. <laughs> Other than that one time, and I thought I had no choice. She's fucking plastered, so I drove us home. The only other time I ever drove was on my buddy's farm on private property out to the gate because it was all icy and didn't think she could get the car out of there, so I drove out. I never drove anywhere. And that was wrong. They came, the police, and charged me with driving whatever the dad was the day that I could drive legally. If the Department of Transport would have sent me a license, it would have been as valid as valid could be. They had no right to do that to me. They could have charged me with not having uh, an up-to-date license or something, but I was legal. And that fucking asshole liar I had said that I should plead guilty. And I said, I'm not guilty of what they're saying. And that other asshole liar that I had same thing, I mean, when went mad, they think. Basically, you're already in jail, I'm going to have to be guilty if you get out right now. I kept saying I'm not guilty. And he was the same asshole lawyer that when Marianne charged for the last time, and he, I told him, no deals. I am innocent. No deals and then they come up with the that they're gonna stay it and I said, for some reason I have to agree and I said I don't agree and he said you have about 15 seconds to decide if you don't agree I can't represent you anymore I'm telling the lawyer that I'm innocent and he's fucking telling me that I have to agree. I said if they stay it and they put conditions on me, that's the same thing as me saying I'm guilty. And I wasn't guilty. That's the thing. The lies, the fucking lies is what I never. And if you went back to the very first fucking time I was ever charged, and looked into it, probably too late to find all the fucking people. But every word I said, I'm saying, I always did say, were true. Every one of them. Barutsky has a lot of anger to unpack, and he's in it for the long haul since he knows he has a hostage audience. My family's been destroyed, my home, everything. All because you believe the lies. You, police, mm -hmm. 
and then you take the lies and you project them to the court and the court's room and the cops know what you're doing. If, if even one time these would have fucking tried to find the real truth, it was there. Every time it was there. And I guess it's all, if you think about all those charts, all those things that I was accused of, it's overwhelming. I sat in jail for a whole year, rotted like a dog, knowing that and, and all I did was read the Bible. Just read, 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 read. Crept up, got a beaten, threatened. Punched out. Because old guys like me that are crippled, you're a mark, you're fun for all the. That's a cruel place there. Which jail is it? Both of them. They're the same. They're all. Kids say, you people, they have no morals. I watched other old guys. Half asleep, sit on a bench, and they'll, you go over and hit that guy in the head, I'll give you my. And it's a fun, it's a joke, knock out an 80 year old man right on the floor, like. Insanity, man, this world was insane. And I speak up, I get it beaten. And now maybe I'm insane. Cracked. Lost it. But I knew, and I tried, and I knew it was fucking losing it. I didn't know how or what was happening, but I knew something was happening. I don't know why I can't remember that Rakowski guy's name. I couldn't believe it. I'm telling him I need to talk to somebody. And he says, you don't want to do it. I said, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm telling you, my head's going to explode. What, um, Basil, what kind of farm is this that Natalie was on that used to be yours? It used to, when I was there, I had wild boar, I raised a couple hundred meat birds, I had cattle. But after, when, shortly after I was gone, she sold everything to different people. And actually, some of those back old friends of hers uh, took a bunch of stuff away. I don't know where I went, I was in jail, I don't know where it went. But there's nothing there now. That, she kept everything. I could never go to court to get any of my stuff. All the the, the farm equipment, the tractors, and all of that were mine, and I brought there from the. And I got nothing. Everything there are still bailers there, and she they're just rotting out in the field. She didn't care. I'm not covered. Not fucking. I don't know who she's with. I don't know anything about her. I have no contact. And Anastasia. I told my, I phoned, I almost had a nervous, uh, she came to the building and she paced for 15 minutes back and forth in front of the building. So she's breaching the condition that I'm supposed to be. I was sitting outside with one of the guys in the building, a Tom that has cancer, and I finally said, that's, and, uh, I timed her. She was there 15 minutes walking back and forth, looking at the building. I don't know what she thought I was going to do. I actually went around the corner and hit. And I kept peeking out though, but she wouldn't see me. Because I thought she was trying to get me thrown back in jail with you. There is no rhyme or reason to what Barutsky will decide to say next. He flits from subject to subject, sometimes doing a social commentary on morals and other times he jumps back to all the perceived injustices he has faced. After the way he described killing his first victim, it's hard to think that this is an attempt to avoid incriminating subjects. And then I talked to my old neighbor, and she apparently got a housekeeping job there, 
And he told me that Anastasia wants to talk to you and she wants to give you something. Now my immediate reaction is fear. She's setting me up. She's trying to put me in jail. I can. She is bipolar. Loaded. So I run. And I do believe I've read a little bit about post-traumatic stress disorder. I believe I have that. But it's caused by use. Use the police. Because yous have attacked me. Yous are the enemy. Over and over and over. I don't understand why. So, Basil, if we're the enemy, and I can certainly see this frustration you have against the police with your experience with them, then why, why did these women get killed instead of police officers. Why not direct this anger towards us rather than them? Because they never got there yet. You're not finished. You're not hearing the story. They told you about the fat man that was selling tobacco to Natalie, stuck a knife into my back. They thought that I was the fucking kingpin in that fucking... I heard enough gossip stories around there that that's why they were watching me might have been at farmhouse. I was afraid there. I was all alone. Light shining, windows middle night, stuck out, blue skirt. So I thought they were all in. I couldn't move, I was afraid. I went for a walk down the road one time, blue scooter. I bet you I walked for a quarter of a mile. Blue scooter just idling right behind me all the way. I'm panicking. I just walk off into the bush. That's probably my name. When I found the gun in the scrap here, that was. And it was there. When they came, they ended up charging me with a bowl that wasn't working. It was my daughter hanging on the wall, and she asked me to fix it. They charged me with a bowl, a cross bowl for my daughter hunting. She left it on my house. One of the coppers seen it and came back and they charged me with having a firearm, which caused me to never have the allowed to have a gun. It was a bowl that I was trying to fix for my daughter. It was just fuck all. Stupid. I wasn't using that for any. I forgot it was there, you think. I couldn't care less. It was a bow. And even my brothers thought I could bow hunt. They, everybody I thought I could bow hunt. I've never read or seen anything where I'm not allowed to have a bow hunt. My whole family's hunters. Stupid. It's like they tried to charge me with every fucking thing. That, and then the retard lawyer tells me I should keep joking. And after a while, I had given up anyway. I had given up. I had gone through so many court things. I didn't care. I do whatever the fuck you want. Stress is just. This, uh, this farm is on Foymont Road. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I mean, what? I think that's the name of it. What happened when you went to Natalie's farm on Tuesday? What happened? I just drove in, walked in the door. She was sitting there. She went in the corner. I followed her. Boom. Walked out. That's it. I don't think there was. And it was funny, it was like I wasn't even pulling the trigger on the gun, the gun was just going off. It was just like, boop. I mean, it's like, I don't know how that. Was there anyone else there? I don't think so. I didn't see anybody. Where did you go after? I then drove again. And uh, I don't know, I was driving. I went to the fat man. I was trying to 
tell you this, the guy that she was getting those backwards from, he was the guy that was selling them. I found out where he lived, a little sawmill. I drove around the place. I talked to two people. I asked them, is the big guy here? And they all said, both said no. One guy said he was there on the other side. The other guy said, no, he's not here. I drove around. And then I left. Did you ever know his name? Never. Madly. All of the... Not me. All I ever knew of him was sold him eggs. When he'd come, she told me to go out and I would sell him eggs. Little peewee eggs and he also said they were for his sister. And he used to buy a little bit of chicken and stuff or something. But that's not what he was there for. It was... I'd sell or go out and get and go back and get eggs and then Natalie would go over and I don't know what the fuck they were doing. I, I, the, and then uh, when I was in jail and shit at the fan and over that and there was people, I don't know how many I heard of charged with or caught with uh, equipment and uh, I knew nothing about any of that. And little by little, I picked these. Even Anastasia knew somebody that had one of those stolen pieces of equipment. The connection between Anastasia and... Brutsky just won't stay focused. He gets out a couple of pertinent sentences, and then it's right back to the past. Natalie was... I, I really don't know the full... If I tried to tell you, I could be lying, so I'm not. I don't know how the real thing happened there between Natalie, the fat man, and... But somehow Anastasia knew... She told me she knew somebody that had one of those back holes. Anastasia used to come to the farm with Eric, the boyfriend. And poor Eric, I don't know whatever happened to him, but Anastasia told me that she was going to charge him. I don't know if the guy pled guilty or what he done or if he went. She told me that Chief was drunk and fell against the rigging and broke it, cracked it. And then she told the police that he pushed her. And I told her that was wrong not to do that. And then I thought I had convinced her. And I went to a friend's house, sit for a week. And when I was gone, she phoned the police and charged him. And I seen the railing and it was, it was a joke. I don't know what happened to him. I did even text him and told, tried to warn him that she was going to charge him with assault and that I was trying to talk her out of it. But he had already told me that she is nuts and what I didn't believe because I don't mean as a friend and I never saw her go give shit. I, this, this is the fat man? No, no. Oh. Eric was the guy. That Anastasia, Anastasia's boyfriend. Yeah. First, he rented my house. Yeah. I was living in the farm for a month. Then they bought the house. And then and they were splitting up. And I didn't, I believed Anastasia, and I think I was wrong. I don't know about the Eric. Basically, you said that. You'd been at a gas station that was closed when you were when you first went to get gas. There's only one gas station in Palmer. I pulled into the parking lot and I sat there for a while because there was a thing the little light was on the gas pump. And what's it called? Gulex. It's Gulex Forest Products, and the gas is very seldom open. But it was a Monday or Tuesday, is it? So. Oh, I phoned there. 
Yes, to see if it was open. This is Gulick's impalmer. Yeah. Okay. But there was no answer. Now, is this after you've been speaking with Elizabeth about the Bible? Yeah, the next day, maybe. But before you went to Carol's? Yeah. And I didn't get gas because <coughs> they were all closed, right? I sat there for a while and then. The um, the phone that uh, you took from Carol's cell phone. Yeah. Um, I only took it because I dumped your purse to find the keys, and there was the phone. I don't know why I picked it. Well, I took. I I, I, was, I don't know. I, I don't remember thinking about it, but I just thought I was going to. Maybe that wasn't. Maybe the thought was. I don't know. I thought I was going to read. I wanted to read why she was laughing when she was texting. She was really laughing a lot in the cottage now, sitting over there. Do you remember where you threw the phone away? You seemed to think it was Eganville, but then you weren't sure. I never went to Eganville. I wouldn't think I threw the phone away. I'm four or five miles from uh, the Plymouth farm because I know it ran and it was on the dash and I just, the window was open, I just threw it. Did you know it was a landmark in the area? O'Neill's skills really shine here as he's somehow able to easily jump back and forth between Barutsky's past and the current crime. There are a lot of names, locations, and random time skips, and he's able to track all of it with only a minimal amount of clarifying questions. I have gone back if, you, if I showed you a map, would you know the road? It's just the same, one, same road. It's, I never did look at it. When it started to ring or chirp, I just assumed it was the guy. Um, there was a nylon uh, rope that uh, the police found at, at Carol's. Do you know anything about that? The yeah. yellow nylon rope? Yeah, that had a, 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 a loop in it that we used, I put through to uh, pull branches. There was a loop tied on the end of it, and that other end was open, I think. And then I slip the open end through the loop and hook it around the branches to drag them to the fire pit. Mm -hmm. How, uh, how did, so how did it end up in the house? It was almost in the house. Carl was giving shit for leaving the tools outside, things outside, in the weather, like. But not even a screwdriver she'd flip out on. Yeah. So everything was. And, uh, cable, TV cable. The rope, I guess, for a while when I picked it up. How do you feel about what's happened to these women, Basil? I don't know what to say to you because there's two, two of me. Well, yeah, it doesn't make sense. But well, let's hear two perspectives. It's not, it's, it's. How do you feel right now? Not at the time is what I'm getting at. Right now, me and you in this room, empty, empty. Confused, even disorientated, if that makes sense. Like, because, and, and like this, there's still, 
Party of Snip. Alright, Party says. I don't have a job. And the other part is saying it's the wrong way. So I have. I don't know. I don't know. I am fucking. I never even realized until I was just talking to you here when I tried. Now I can't even bring it back. When I tried to explain to you about me being here and I've done something about the, the zombie was there and I tr I tried to explain it to you here and it, uh, that made something because I never saw it again. I don't know how I done it. I explained it to you without me fucking. I'm married now. I don't even know what the hell I explained to you. If that well, makes do you understand how what's happened to these three women is is wrong? Yeah. Would you take it back if you could? Of course you would. Brutsky says that his memories aren't completely clear and he can't recall every detail about what he did. This can happen, although many suspects lie to cover up their crime. This case is a bit more unique in the fact that Barutsky isn't trying to hide that he killed them. The way that he describes killing Carol Culloden proves that. He's admitted to killing three people, so deliberately hiding where he threw the phone wouldn't make any sense. Anastasia, why did you lie? Why couldn't she just have said, I'm sorry, and I'm sure not I would have stopped. But no, I would have been enough. Or say, because, or say, and it's because you lied. It would have stopped right there, but she still lied. And and Carl lies. And I talked to her so much about the tr being honest and the truth and positive, and and she still lied. I told her about oh, how lies have fucked me and my family and my life and my uh, how it has projected me as something I'm not. Uh, my uh, I don't really care, but. <laughs> I don't have a bad bone in my body. I. So many people know about all the things my ex wife done. I've been told I would never put up with that. I would be so mad. I would kill her. Uh, all of these things. And I, every time I, read, I said, all I feel is pity. I feel sorry for her. I told my kids, I feel sorry for your mother. And I tell them that if they could. Help her, I can't anymore. They were gonna one time do, they heard them talking about a, an intervention. I was happy and thought, oh, the kids will get together, they'll do something. So, I feel sorry for my next wife. And you asked me about the police. Yeah, they're the cop because Miller put it to me for nothing and the other one was Laura's friend, the cop, I can't even remember his name. He 
because he passed to me and he was fucking cruel. Laura's friend the cop. Don't remember his name. It's right in there, but it's not there. Dirty, dirty fucking car. The one I'm talking about used to sell cocaine in high school. He was in high school. Laura, I guess, was in high school. She's older. And Laura's a type older drug addict. I know this for a fact because I don't know how many people told me about him, and now he's a police officer and a fighter. When Laura stole my truck, we didn't even talk about that. He came, I phoned the police, he came instead of following through. And I told him, I said, it shouldn't be you. This is a conflict of interest because you're a friend of hers. And he just kept on talking. I said, why? There's another cruiser. I said, why is that cop talking? I don't know him. He said, no. He kept on. Then he left my place and he went directly to her place and told her everything that I said and that she was going to be charged. And, and then after, a day or two later, then he removed himself from the case because of a conflict of interest. But first he went and then it went to a Shirley Bird and a, uh, Laura stole my credit cards in Ottawa. And I thought it so simple. The video in the store. Once again, Barutsky is talking about people unrelated to the case. He seems to have a long list of grudges, and it raises the question of whether or not he would have killed more of these people if he had been able to get to them. City at Christmas, her using my card, and nothing happened. Nothing. I, why does that cost me? He was supposed to go and talk to the tow truck driver. I remember reading some of the paper, and he never did. I went to talk to the tow truck driver and asked, did that cop ever come and ask you? No. And yet I read Shirley Bird's thing, assigning that cop to go. And that's why I went and asked the, the tow truck driver myself. No, never did show up. So anything to not the truth is what happened. And it's the same, yeah, yeah, it's the same time that uh, the two cops beat me up New Year's Eve because they seen the criminal record. I was the designated driver. I don't care what anybody says. To I did not drink. She was drunk. I was driving her home. I pretended to drink that night because she's bipolar, so she would push me with her drink. I'd take it, I'd hold it. A little while later, she'd take it out of my hand and give it back. She'd put it, I'd hold it. I never took one fucking drink. She thought I was drinking. But that was to appease her. As long as she thought I was drinking, she was happy. I had to drink with her. I didn't drink. And then the cops, uh, they pulled me over, and I heard the roadside. It wasn't a roadside, it was just two cops drunk in a police cruiser on the back road that I used to get home. They'd been there for hours because there was that much snow on the road. And I pulled over, and two of them get out, and they're both fucking wobbling, and the radio and that cruiser was so loud you couldn't even hear. And they told them I was a designated driver, and whatever, and they just carry on. And then a little while I'm not quite home, the same cruiser comes pulls me over again. And that's because they read uh, the computer thing. They ran my plate and there was uh, Basil Roots who was charged with rape and whatever. Eight, Twelve charges that weren't supposed to be there. He was found not guilty of them. That was all a loony wife. I was already years before and gone. And it was. I was never found guilty of none. And that's why the police should have seen that. And the next time she went nuts, they should have been saying, hey, look at this lady's loony. 
she ran in through the ringer twice already. Now this is the third time. Why aren't we looking at his side? And, but that's not the way it was. They, again. And then I lost my house over that. It's crazy. When you look at... Uh, I know where that cop lives on Mask Island in Barry's Bay, and I can't remember his name. It's not there. Mask Island? It's right in the town of Barry's Bay. There's a little causeway in Mask Island. He lives on it. And this is OPP guy? Yeah. By the way, when you look back at everything that's happened to you here over the last couple of days since, since Monday, do you feel sorry about how it all ended? Of course I feel sorry. Maybe that's why I didn't. No, I know why I didn't shoot myself. But I did know that if I kept the gun and waved it around, for sure I would have been shot. I was thinking, but not thinking. I was thinking of think I think I was thinking a little better when I sat down at that picnic table and I started writing. For some reason things seem to be more clear or Must have because I didn't move anymore. How long were you there? A couple of hours. Did you find the booze? Did you, you have booze though? I had a, fur, a bottle of Farty Creek and a bottle of wine and a little bottle of Fireball. I left the car and we went through the bush back out to the highway and I crossed the highway. And before we found the gun, I left the booze there because I planned on drinking and blowing my head off. Brutsky claims he was planning on committing suicide, which would not be an easy task with the weapon he was using, especially if he got drunk first. That fact alone might have given him second thoughts. Others have tried it that way and lived afterwards with devastating injuries. And then uh, by that time I start thinking about it, you know, you can't do that basically you're innocent. If you blow your head off, you'll never go to heaven because... <laughs> So the booze you left with the gun in the bush? No, I dropped the booze, then a while later I left the gun. Maybe not far apart, 100 yards, 200 yards, I don't know. I just knocked the booze down. Then later I went, I was walking, I'm not in good, good shape. I don't know how long it took me to get that far. I know I was really, really tired. I remember my right leg was really sore, so I was starting to flopping around. Maybe there was in a plantation where I left the booze. They had a dog there. They must have found him. Did not backtrack me. Like, they, you know what they may have? I just don't know. This is the first I've heard of some booze. So. They, they may have already found it. I don't know. I didn't open any of it. They were all new full bottles. Okay. I left the hundred dollars in Cheryl's console for gas. I thought I was gonna get shot, so I texted her and told her I'm sorry. Are there any uh, any other victims out here that we need to know about, Basil? Yeah, like I love these three women here. Is there anybody else? No. No other bodies that we're going to find? <laughs> no. Okay. I don't think so. No. Okay. No. Let me ask you this, Basil. I understand that you don't uh, give them this trust for police and you don't like them. And I get that. If you're listening to me, I, could have. I am listening. But what I want to ask you is this. <coughs> the time you and I have been in here together today, yeah. have, have I treated you fairly? I don't know. 
Well, you're you. You're sitting here, right? I don't know if you should be friendly. I don't know. I don't even really know what you're doing. I don't know if you're going to take whatever I said and twist it around because that's what happens. Make a nightmare out of it. Like, make it worse. Make it fucking, I don't know, can you make it worse? I don't know. I don't know. I don't trust you. If you're asking me that, no. You're treating me fairly. You haven't beat on me. I've been beat on you. Yeah. And that's what I get to have. I treat you fairly here today. If that's what you call fair in the day, yeah. You got the water and the... Well, I haven't, certainly haven't beat on you at all, correct? Mm -hmm. I haven't threatened you or I haven't been mean to you, I don't think. No. Okay. Do you need a, another cigarette? Yeah, there's a lot of fun. I said better you just quit the small thing. No, I don't I don't think that's the case. Um you still have water there? Okay. I, I, wish, big I, I wish I could get uh, some meds from my back for the pain or see a doctor. I, I mean maybe I'd like to see a psychiatrist that maybe uh geez, what I would like to know what uh, how would this happen? Although well, that information you give me about your doctor and your condition, I'm going to make sure that the investigators have it so they can look into getting you uh, whatever I meds you need. I would trust talking to a psychiatrist more than I trust you. Okay. It's a psychiatrist, a doctor, you're a cop. This is. You got it. Okay, let me just get that smoke break. Right. Even though O'Neill has been patient and compassionate and has done everything possible to ensure that Barutsky feels comfortable, Barutsky still doesn't trust him. In fact, he's almost irritated that O'Neill has been civil since it gives him nothing to complain about. If he sticks true to form, that won't stop him. You know, uh, here you go, Vincent. In case you want something else to eat. You know, Let's like, uh, um, I tell you that I don't hate my ex wife for what you've done to me because I know what happened to her. Randy, and that messed her up, and then I read books and talked. So I can understand, and I can understand why she struck out with me. So that's why I, she, I never even thought of ever killing her. Okay. Who? I mean, her or uh, anything. And then Carl, who I called Jiggy, her husband died five or six years ago. Five. But anyway, she never ever got over that. And she is, uh, I actually told her that she should go to a counselor. She never dealt with the death part. And I call her Jiggy. You know what Jiggy is? Like, like the fishing for fish. Yeah. Here's the bait, take the bait away. Here's the bait, take the bait away. I told her that's the way you treat me, Carol. You, uh, you, uh, you asked me to do stuff for you. And then when I do it, you tell me that I wasn't supposed to do it or that I've done it. She was, I don't think bipolar, but she had a, and then there was this wrong guy that used to come. He even used to tell her. I remember hearing him say, like, Terry, you just gotta make your mind, you keep changing your mind. And Who's, so Randy is your ex-wife's daughter's, who's Randy? My ex-wife's brother. Your ex-wife's brother is Randy. Randy Mask. Mask. Like M A S K. -S -K. My ex wife's name was Mary Ann Mask. I don't know if she's a mask or a brood skin anymore because I haven't spoken to her since. Okay. And this fat guy, we don't know his name. his name. He owns a sawmill in a little tiny sawmill, lives in a house trailer. 
And where is this all now? Let me try to keep. Okay. The short break seems to have helped Baruski gain enough control to calm down for the time being, although he is still hung up on perceived slights from the past. The way it was explained to me is that there's a, it's in the town of White Lake. There's a roadside park at the lake, you know what I mean? Like a place with picnic tables, maybe a park. And he basically, he lived right next door to it on the lake, in the trailer, and there's a little sawmill in the back. Is there a name for the sawmill? It's in White Lake. Right beside the... That's how I found it. That's why I, and I just drove in there and I said, is the big guy here? And the guy just uh, knew what I would meant by the big guy because uh, the guy is like 400, 500 pounds. I don't know. He's okay. huge. Last night. I haven't seen the man since I was on that farm. He'd come for ice. So that's four years ago, five, I don't know. But I never really did get to see him. This, this road that goes out to your, your farm and Natalie's farm, yeah. were you through the phone away? I don't know where I threw the phone away. I just know oh, no, but just what's, what, you know the name of the road? or It's that road that the farm's on. I was going towards Eganville, but I never went to Eganville, so it's before... I don't even know where I turned. I turned off that road, off the back road, and then I came out on it. And then I was in Baker. So, Dacre's the only place I remember. The sign Dacre. And I remember thinking, what the fuck am I doing here? And the answer would just be, well, God, you must know what you're doing. I'm in Dacre. And then the next thing, you know, uh, there was, I talked all the way. So, where's when you get to Dacre, where's the farm in relation to Dacre? Mm -hmm. Way before, mm. an hour maybe before. Right. Give me a piece of paper. Farm, long driveway inside, highway, Eagle Road. That way, mm -hmm. maybe five minutes. Then before I went, I didn't go to you, but I went that way. And then uh, I don't know the road. There's a it's not a road. I didn't turn ninety degrees. I turned like that. I think. No, I turned, you know what I mean? It wasn't an intersection road, it wasn't straight, it was a, almost like a, they just peel off. Maybe it wasn't peel off, maybe it is. Or it's a road that uh, I went off and it, right, or as soon as I went off, there's a curve or like that or something right there. And this is right where you got rid of the phone? No, I threw the phone out on the left side. I went to the left side of the highway and just fired it out the window into the ditch. So I wasn't even in my lane. I remember grabbed the phone, gone, as soon as it rang. So which way is north here? I assume. The sun come up and the of the well, how about this? This is the fire where this is Eagle. This, this must be north. If this is the fire where this is Eagle. Is the phone you threw it somewhere between? Between the farm and that road that I turned on. Okay. And this road took me out to Highway 41. In 41, I turned left. Then I, uh, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, if I would have stayed on 41, I would have came to Baker. But I didn't. I turned left and I went through it. And then, then I turned right. And I, and I couldn't believe it when I came 
some about Dacre because in my mind, if I just kept going, I'd been Dacre and how am I in Dacre now? Like, I remember that sign. Text messages were later recovered and confirmed the stalkerish behavior described by friends of Kalutin. Within three months, Brutsky sent over 100 texts. Kalutin replied only 15 times. The last messages from Perutsky claimed that she was cruel and heartless and that karma would get her. Do you remember what the phone looked like? What flip phone? Flip phone? Is it black or gray or colored? Or kind of color too. Very colorblind. I used to be a pilot and they wouldn't let me fly to give them colorblind. Uh, I can't. Why just want to find the phone? Is that what you want to do? Yeah, yeah. I would like to find the phone if we could. Do you remember what make it was? I, got I didn't look at the phone. It fell out of the purse. I got the keys. I picked it, the phone up with the keys. Threw it on the dash and never touched it, never looked in it till it rang and I fucking threw it out because. Okay. <sighs> yeah, I don't know how to tell you any because I don't know. Really. No, you, you've put a great effort in. There's miles between the farm and this road, like 15, maybe. But I do know I threw it on the left side of the road because I threw it with my left hand because it was. And uh, I'm trying to think of something that I may remember, but I don't remember. This isn't like me driving. Can you fucking understand that? Jesus, this is fucking hard. Definitely very hard. And that's why I said you're doing a great job. Of this working. wasn't me. Fuck, it was me! Oh, I was... I was going places where I fucking had no idea. And it was like, someone was telling me to go here, to go there, to fucking... This road, that road, fucking... I never met one cruiser or nothing because the sight of a cruiser panics me. I remember nothing. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm sort of, something's telling me I was going around the corner in the highway when it rang, but I don't fucking know. I don't know. Maybe there was. I wouldn't go back there. You know what a Schumacher tree is? Ah, if you don't, I don't, I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember. No, no, I don't know. It wasn't in my head. It was like a tape. You can't understand. I tried to tell you. And like a tape playing, and the fucking tape broke when I got to where the fat man was because everything was as if it was a play. Carl opened the door. Anastasia walked right out the door. I opened the door in the house. I walked out the door, opened it, and Natalie's right there. It was like as if it was supposed to be. It was like, and, and in my, it was fast. It was not like. If you think about the distance, I don't know what it is, but it's quite a piece from one place to the other, but it was like, more like bang, bang, bang. And there was no bang, I didn't even take the gun. I had the gun, I had the gun, not the... And, uh, and I don't even know if I, uh, I, I, me, it was I asked a question, and as soon as I asked the question, she lied, and that's what it's just like lie bang. Same with Anastasia. I said, Why did you lie in court? She said, I didn't bang. It was 
and uh, there was even no sound. And it wasn't like a pop, and it wasn't like that I pulled the trigger. It was fucking, I don't know what the word is. It's Barutsky's account doesn't quite line up. Cullen was alone when he killed her, but there were witnesses to the two other deaths. Anastasia Kuzik's sister was staying with her and went downstairs to find her on the floor with Barutsky in the room, so her death did not occur outside. Natalie Warmerdam's son was home when his mother was shot, and he said Barutsky entered and chased his mother through a couple rooms. A security camera confirms that he walked right into the house without anyone opening the door to let him in. The discrepancies are most likely due to the story that Brutsky wrote for himself in his own mind, where he is able to confront the women for their supposed wrongs, before dealing out what he believed to be justice. I'm telling you, man, I fucking... And it's not just that, it's I know now, or I think, or I can see back, because I remember, I never even remember, but knew about the... Uh, I'm trying to tell you, but I fucking don't know how. It's like I'm standing here, and I can see myself going to the car. No, see, I'm confusing stuff. Yeah, I was going to the car. Then I went left, because that's where the gun was. And I watched that. Then I came back to the car. The whole part is like me being in the parking lot watching. And then I guess I was in the car. Okay, Basil, I'm going to step out for a second and just uh, talk with my partner for many years, see if there's anything else I need. Why don't you just take a, take a break? Is there a partner watching all this or something? Oh, yeah, there's somebody watching. On that, the black, uh, you know, we showed you the black balls. Oh. I'll be right back. Please. Okay, Basil. You know, I don't think I ate in days either because there's a. I've had the diarrhea earlier today and it just smells like sulfur. Yeah. I don't know what. I don't know what that means. I've never. Uh, so listen, um, we're gonna get you over to uh, the courthouse, okay? We gotta go. What so time is it? Uh, it's, a, I think it's about two thirty. Two thirty. So if you want to eat your sandwich and then you can throw your uh, shoes. I'm afraid to eat it because my stomach. Oh, I see. They okay. gave me a granola bar or something. And about right after my stomach just okay. started. But it's a little bit of it. If you hear a car going here. If you, you know, don't uh, feel like you have to eat if you don't want to, all right? I'm going to shit my pants. That's what I'm worried about. Do you want to uh, do you want to hit the bathroom here before you go to court? Next door. I want to tell you about that other. They're be talking about the, um, the thing stuff. I want to tell you another thing about the police. I was in Ottawa jail. They were taking me to kill Lou and Patty White. I told them that I need to go to the bathroom. And the paddy wagon stopped in Renfrew from Ottawa to Renfrew. I kept telling them, I need to go to the bathroom. I'm going to piss my pants. And I have problems. I got hernia. I cannot hold. Mm -hmm. Then when we got, we went to Pembroke. I thought, I didn't even know. I thought I was hanging on there so when we get to Pembroke, I'll be able to have a leak. 
in Hamburg to leave me in a paddy wagon and to take somebody else in and to leave me up there. And I said, I need a piss. They ignored me. And then we go from Pembroke through Run Lake all the way to Kildoo, another hour. And at Kildoo, I'm the only one in the paddy wagon and I'm telling the guard or what a copper is all peeping. Piss. I'm going to piss my pants. I said, You want me to piss on the floor in the paddy wagon? He said, If you do, you're going to clean it up. There's something wrong with police when they're. And he, he just ignored me. We were at the paddy wagon. I even told him, I said, just let me out so I can piss in the bush over there. Anything. And then when they took me in, they took me into a room. And again, I'm telling the guy behind the desk, I need to piss. And everybody just ignored me. So I finally, they put me in the room and I'm yelling, if you don't let me go to the bathroom, I'm gonna. Like, man, I asked 30 times. Then they charged me with not by not at least some. They charged me with doing these mischief. Mischief. I begged them. I had no choice. How is that? Does that is that normal? Is that right? I don't think so. Right and wrong. So that's what I'm telling you. No wonder. How can I not see the police as being malicious? I understand. That is know. malicious. I begged. And then when I have no choice, they charge me. And then they told me, and I spit in the guy's face then, because of course, I, look what you've done to me. Like you, what am I supposed to do? Uh, how can they put that on me? That's malicious. That is, they force me. And that I can go on and on and on. I didn't get here by myself. You fuckers drove me crazy. I begged you to do something. I went to the Pembroke police and I fucking told them that about the wife beating me up. I told them the whole thing about her slapping me in the fucking nothing. I told them about that alarm. That asshole cop. Determined to end his questioning the same way in which he began, Barutsky returns to his long saga of being persecuted by the police. Covered that all up, mate. I don't know how. You've, you've covered a lot of ground, Basil, and I can understand why you'd be upset with all the things we've talked about here. It's not upset. It's not upset. I never, ever, through all of that, ever thought about anger. It was always, I told people, it's frustration. I'm not angry. I'm frustrated. Nobody's listening. Anger would have been, I would have shot at a cop a long time ago. How many years? 20 years went by? I never had the thought. All my things were about make it right, fix it, help my wife, get the truth to come out. I always believed that someday, maybe, I will be vindicated, even if I only had three days of life where I fucking feel like I'm normal. Like, fuck, I never deserved one of these fucking things. Not one. And there's more. It just goes on and on and on and on. And if you look in all of those papers that I have, that I've been writing for 20 years about all the things that have happened to me. And I, all of that's true. If there's not, if there's something in any of that that's not true, it's because I'm writing about it. And it happened 10 years ago, so maybe I'm not remembering it exactly the way it was but if, if you look through all that i probably wrote about 10 years ago too because like i said nobody listened so i took to writing and there's tape recordings there there's tapes probably a hundred okay. going back as far as when my kids were six my older daughter was only six years old and i took the tape recording and i would record every conversation practically so that 
I couldn't be accused. I was even accused of my ex-wife of molesting her stepdaughter. And they ended up going to uh, the uh, children's aid or something. I had to go and, and then they, the children's aid told me that I, we definitely do, don't believe that you ever molested or touched Candace. So Candace obviously spoke well. So that, that should have been their first clue that she was lying and I was telling the truth. And should that not have changed the... Uh, I guess it's garbage now. That doesn't matter. It'll still work for you. It won't work on. You know, it'll be all right. There you go. Okay, sir. The interview is concluded and O'Neill escorts him from the room over to the courthouse. On December 6, 2017, Basil Barutsky was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of three women and is ineligible for parole for 70 years, at which time he will be 128 years old. Barutsky chose not to hire a lawyer and instead represented himself, but refused to speak through most of the proceedings. It was decided accurately that earlier parole should not be made available and he is dangerous to the public. Barutsky neither forgives nor forgets, and anyone who he sees as sliding him in any way would be a potential victim. As we have seen in this video, Barutsky bears grudges against many people. It is very possible that his arrest and imprisonment have saved their lives.